Section 1 of The Early Misadventures of Toffee by Charles F. Myers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. I'll Dream of You. Toffee leaned back against the tree and passed a slender hand through her red hair. As her arm relaxed, she let it fall carelessly about Mark's neck. Lazily, her green eyes traced his profile and found it, if not classic, highly satisfactory. "'Kiss me,' she said. "'Oh, for Pete's sake,' murmured Mark, continuing to stare straight ahead. Toffee followed his gaze to the scene before them. The entire countryside, apparently unaware of its inherent stateliness, was caught in a sort of informal gaiety. "'It's beautiful, isn't it?' Toffee asked. "'Yes.' replied Mark dreamily. You seem fascinated by beauty, almost starved for it. Mark nodded and leaned his head back further on the tree. Then get fascinated, you dope. Toffee leaned forward to face him. Huh? Mark stared at the girl as though he hadn't been quite aware of her before. I'm beautiful too and twice as much fun. It was a simple state of fact. Kiss me, she added. Haven't you any restraint? With everything else I have, you ask for restraint. Toffee drew nearer. You're shameless, said Mark. Naturally. Toffee closed her eyes and advanced her lips to his. Abruptly, Mark threw his hands to the grass before him and boosted himself to his feet, leaving Toffee's arm to fall dejectedly to her side. Maybe next time, she murmured, shrugging her shoulders. Even the glacial age had to come to an end eventually. Mark caught hold of a limb just over his head and swung effortlessly to a branch above Toffee, where he settled himself comfortably and continued his studied contemplation of the landscape. Toffee reached a hand toward him and waited. "'Well, don't just sit there like a stone image,' she called. "'Give me a hand. I want up, too.' Slowly, Mark looked down at her and studied the pert, upturned face with solemn gravity. Suddenly, he shook his head and returned to his attitude of somber speculation. Toffee seemed not at all daunted. I'll show you, she yelled. I'll shake you out of there like a coconut. With that, she took hold of the tree and began to tug at it vehemently, until slowly it began to sway. As though she had pulled a bell cord, a soft, distinct tolling began to make itself heard, and as the tree swayed more violently, the sound became louder. Soon the motion of the tree became so great that Mark found himself clutching the branch to keep his balance. For the love of Mike, Toffee, he yelled through the uproar of the bell. Stop it! Do you want me to break my neck? But I'm not doing it, hollered Toffee. It seemed that the tree had become possessed of a will of its own as it rocked back and forth in a constantly increasing arc. Toffee stood back from it in terror. As it made a new deeper lunge, Mark lost his seat but continued to cling to the branch with his hands. At the end of the arc, the tree seemed to pause in anticipation of a final gigantic thrust. As it did so, the clap of the bell was almost intolerable. Suddenly, Mark felt himself lifted and hurled swiftly into space. He seemed to be flying upward and away from the earth as though the force of gravity had utterly forsaken him. As he sailed along, he looked back over his shoulder to behold a scene that was especially disconcerting. All the earth below him seemed to be caught in the swaying motion of the tree. It rocked crazily in a seesaw motion, constantly accompanied by the tolling of a great ghostly bell. Then suddenly, the action stopped. The earth shuddered and seemed to crumble, falling into space. Through the ensuing quiet, Mark could only wonder at what had happened. Then faintly, through the sound of rushing air, he began to hear his name being called. He turned his head quickly to see Toffee rushing through space after him. "'Wait, Mark! Wait!' she cried. He reached a hand out toward her. Mark's hand fell heavily to the alarm clock on the bedside table and the noise ceased. The fact that he was awake didn't mean that he was rested. He rolled over in the bed without opening his eyes and began carefully to review the dream, for it had left him strangely uneasy. The thing that disturbed him most was the girl, Toffee. As he thought of her, she became more and more vivid, more and more insistent as a real personality. It was strange how real she did seem, especially since she had been so unlike any girl that Mark had ever known. It wasn't that he wouldn't have liked to have known a girl like that. It was just that he had been so occupied with the development of the Pillsworth Advertising Agency that he rarely had time for girls like, or unlike, Toffee. The dream had brought to him a vague suspicion that perhaps something was missing in his life. Something like Toffee, for instance. 
There was Julie Mason, of course, Mark's secretary, but although she was an even match for any model that had ever been in the office, Julie was still a very efficient businesswoman, and for some reason that cancelled irrevocably any idea of romance. He sat up in bed and stretched his arms up over his head, yawning luxuriously. Suddenly he became transfixed, his arms rigid above him and his mouth wide open. He stared in fascination at the foot of the bed. Toffee turned and smiled wickedly. I almost didn't make it, she said. Thanks for the lift. Mark's lips worked feverishly but produced nothing intelligible. Well, don't just sit there making faces. Tell me how glad you are to see me. And put your arms down. Slowly and mechanically, Mark lowered his arms. Now, Toffee continued, let's not waste time. Kiss me. She raised herself from the edge of the bed and moved toward him. Instantly, Mark became animated, leaping from the bed like a flushed bird. He rushed to the window and seemed about to jump when, suddenly, he halted. Slowly, he turned and faced her. I've gone mad, he muttered. I'm nuts! Toffee remained by the bed in a state of acute bewilderment. This wasn't precisely the reaction that she had expected. We're not going through all that again, her voice expressed utter disappointment. Get out, yelled Mark. Get out of here, you... you... You figment? But, Mark, don't you know me? I'm Toffee, your dream girl. Go get yourself into a dream, then, yelled Mark. I'm awake. Oh, I see what's troubling you. A bright smile lighted Toffee's face. Now, just come over here and sit down while I explain everything. She extended a hand to him, and, fascinated, Mark moved toward her and sat down gingerly on the edge of the bed. That's nice, cooed Toffee. Now, just stop being so jumpy, and I'll tell you all about it. In the first place, you dreamed me up. All I am, I owe to you, and judging by the mirror, I'd say that was plenty. Up until now, I've existed only in your subconscious. But last night, while you were dreaming, you released me, gave me physical dimensions and a personality. Now, that works both ways. It was the first chance I'd had to see you, too. Well, it seemed that you were a nice enough guy, but a little mixed up about a lot of important things. So I decided to materialize myself and help you out. And let me tell you, that materializing stuff is no easy proposition. Mark's eyes filled with wonder. You mean to tell me you're really here? In the flesh, I mean. Toffee slowly crossed one lovely leg over the other. What do you think? She asked. Well, you'll have to go back, Mark yelled, jumping up. It's very nice of you to want to help out and all, but... I can take care of things for myself. Thank you very much. Now, goodbye. He stood back from her as though expecting an explosion, but nothing happened. Well, you heard me. Goodbye. Fade. Dematerialize. Do your stuff. Toffee smiled mysteriously and shook her head. Sorry, boss. I can't do it. The only way for me to disappear is for you to go to sleep. Then I have to return. But when you wake up, I'll be right back. Once you get it started, it works automatically, of course. There is one way to get rid of me for good, but we won't go into that. Not just yet, anyway. And while we're on the subject, I may as well tell you. I'm pretty sick of that subconscious of yours. A girl could certainly ask for better company. I've never seen so many stuffy ideas. All that will be changed, of course. Mark shuddered as Toffee sat back with a satisfied smile. You're completely unprincipled, he groaned. You'd better not start criticizing. Like the man says, you made me what I am today, and you'd bloody well better be satisfied. Toffee was interrupted by a timid knock on the door. Good grief, cried Mark. That's Joseph. Do something. Toffee knew exactly what to do. She ran quickly to the mirror, and after several pats at her hair, turned in a seductive pose to face the door. It was then that Mark noticed her costume, a light, transparent affair that seemed but half inclined to stay in place. The tableau that she presented was effective, but extremely alarming under the circumstances. "'What do you think you're doing?' hissed Mark. "'I like to look my best when gentlemen are calling,' giggled Toffee. Frantically, Mark rushed and grabbed a sheet, then rushed to Toffee with some idea of concealing her. Of course, Toffee was of no mind to have her obvious charms hidden, and a wild struggle ensued. Slowly the door opened, and an aged head appeared in the opening. Large, watery eyes fell on the disturbing scene and became even larger. Instantly, the head disappeared and the door slammed too. There, now, see what you've done? yelled Mark. Toffee threw the sheet disdainfully aside. And what do you expect a lady to do when she's attacked? Attacked? Mark screamed indignantly. Just because another man comes into the room is no reason for you to go 
showing off like a juvenile delinquent. Mark snorted with helpless rage. I was trying to cover you up. Oh, murmured Toffee with obvious disappointment. Joseph is one of the best valets in the business, but also one of the most moral, explained Mark. I've had to be a regular saint to keep him, and now you... He'll quit me like a flash. You'll be better off without him, said Toffee with conviction. You see, I'm beginning to help you already. Mark tossed a dressing gown to Toffee with instructions to put it on and wait for him in the sitting room. He dressed quickly and joined her there with deep misgivings as Toffee looked up brightly from the divan. This is a pretty swank apartment, Mark. You must be rich. Never mind that. We've got to do something about you, he said, seating himself beside her. I'm just loaded with suggestions, said Toffee archly. You're just loaded, growled Mark. You can't stay here, and I can't turn you loose in that get-up. He indicated her brief costume. You could buy me some clothes, suggested Toffee. Silently, Joseph shuffled into the room, halted just behind them, and fixed his eyes firmly on the ceiling. He cleared his throat with a bark that would have done Lassie all kinds of credit. Mark started from his seat as though he had been kicked. Breakfast, announced Joseph in a voice that made it sound like a direct accusation. As the elevator door closed behind Mark and Toffee, a low whistle issued from the cage. The operator had let them out in the basement, whether from confusion or discretion, Mark couldn't be sure but decided that perhaps it was all for the best. By keeping Toffee low and behind him, they managed to get to the car in the downstairs garage without attracting too much attention. Once out in the street, Mark felt better, but the ordeal to come had him worried. Toffee had insisted on selecting the clothes in person. Now, get what you need, instructed Mark, but get it in a hurry, and above all, get something to put on just as soon as we get inside. Toffee nodded excitedly. By repeating the crouch-and-run routine, they managed to get into the store safely, and luckily, it was still early enough that only a few customers were about. Mark quickly hid Toffee behind a clothes rack and went in search of an understanding sales lady. He spotted a neon marker at the other side of the store that said, Ladies Ready to Wear, and made his way in that direction. As he entered the department, a tousled gray head jutted from behind a plaster figure, and Mark stared back in alarm. Two beady black eyes rolled crazily and the teeth were bared, clinching an amazing number of straight pins. Slowly a gnarled hand appeared beneath the chin and the mouth spewed the pins into it and broke into a horrible grimace that was apparently meant to be a smile. "'I'm Miss Clatt,' the small piping voice sounded somewhat lost in the horrible head. "'May I help you?' Slowly the head moved from behind the figure, dragging with it a small well-padded body perched precariously atop a pair of delicate pipe-stem legs." "'I need an outfit,' stammered Mark. "'A complete outfit.' "'Oh,' replied Miss Clatt disappointedly. "'You'll find men's furnishings on the third floor. "'Just take the elevator.' "'You don't understand,' said Mark hurriedly. "'It's a lady's outfit I want.' Miss Clatt looked disapproving. "'You'll find a theatrical costumer in the next block.' "'No, no, I want it for a lady. "'She's with me, waiting up front there.' Mark gestured toward the main entrance. I'd appreciate it if you'd hurry. She hasn't any clothes. Miss Clatt's hand went to her throat and her eyes began to roll again. Naked? She whispered. No, of course not, replied Mark with dignity. She's wearing a robe. Oh, said Miss Clatt as if that explained everything. Then, on second thought, added, Oh, dear. Swiftly they moved across the store with Mark in the lead and Miss Clatt hopping along behind him. Mark stopped before the clothing rack and parted the coats hanging on it, only to be greeted by the blank wall. "'I left her right here,' he said, turning to Miss Clatt in bewilderment. But the old lady wasn't listening. "'Gracious,' she said. Her eyes had begun to rotate again, and she was staring toward the sidewalk. Mark followed her gaze and saw what appeared to be a small riot before the store. Leaving the bewildered Miss Clatt by the rack, he raced for the door and forced his way into the crowd. "'It's just shameful what these stores will do for publicity.' said a lady's voice. Just shameful. Stop crowding, bud, said a little man as Mark shoved past him. I want to see, too. Ain't seen anything like this since I got married. Mark stretched to his toes and peered into the window. It was even worse than he had expected. There in the showcase was Toffee. She had managed to get a black evening gown off one of the mannequins and was trying to put it on without removing the robe. This operation led to a series of maneuvers that would have sent any professional stripper into paroxysms of envy. Occasionally, she paused in her questionable activities to smile at the crowd about the window and acknowledge the resultant cheers of encouragement. 
Mark wheeled about and fought his way wildly back into the store. Heavens, gasped Miss Clatt as he raced past, almost knocking her down. What a strange young man, so impetuous. Frantically, Mark clawed at the showcase door and finally got it open. Stop that, he yelled as he jumped into the case. But you told me to get something to wear right away, cried Toffee. At Mark's appearance in the window, the crowd became momentarily silent, awaiting developments. Mark ran to Toffee and, getting between her and her audience, tried to disengage the black dress. Stop that, yelled Toffee. I've almost got it on. But her words were lost in an angry roar from the crowd. Just like my husband, murmured a matronly lady. Never wants me to have a thing to wear. Look at that poor child, almost naked. A salesgirl from the five and ten paused on her way to work. Just like my Oscar, she remarked bitterly as she peered into the window. No sense of the time and place. Inside the window, a state of chaos had swiftly been reached. In their struggle, Toffee and Mark had managed to knock down several dummies and get themselves hopelessly entangled in the mess. The scene was now made up entirely of a horrible wild mass of frantic arms and legs. Suddenly the mob became silent once more at the rather dismaying appearance of Miss Clatt in the window. She stopped short and surveyed the terrifying display with eyes that revolved like pinwheels. Hastily she gained the front of the window by a series of quick, sidestepping hops and pulled down the huge shade, shutting off the window from the street. Instantly a loud roar of disappointment was heard from the crowd. "'My, my!' murmured Miss Clatt as she reached into the heap of arms and legs in an attempt to disentangle the frantic couple. Toffee was the first to emerge. Miraculously, she had somehow managed, during the struggle, to get into the evening gown. She smiled at Miss Clatt. "'I can't stand men who make scenes, can you?' she asked haughtily. "'I make scenes?' yelled Mark, casting a dummy aside. "'You heard me,' said Toffee, icily as she stalked from the window with an air of outraged dignity. Mark stood for a moment, glaring after her. Finally noticing that Miss Clatt was plucking at his sleeve, he helped her from the case and followed. When they reached the ladies ready to wear department, they found Toffee posing before a full-length mirror. She turned to Mark and smiled ecstatically. She looked radiant. I could almost forgive you, she cooed. Mark couldn't say anything. He just glowered. For fifteen years, Mark Pillsworth hadn't been late for work for a single day. So it was no wonder that his appearance at noon caused considerable excited speculation throughout the agency. The fact that he was accompanied by an extremely racy-looking redhead in a black evening gown lent real shock value to the occasion. To make matters worse, Mark managed to announce his humiliation to the entire staff by rushing through the outer office like a reluctant criminal being taken into custody before a battery of newsreel cameras. Toffee, however, aware that she was cutting quite a figure, most of which was startlingly apparent, was like a flower girl at a wedding. She had warm smiles for everyone, especially the men. Swiftly, Mark gained the door to his private office and disappeared inside, but Toffee, upon reaching it, caught in the gala atmosphere of the occasion, turned to face the astonished group. "'You wonderful people,' she began. What message she had for the employees of the Pillsworth Agency was to remain forever a mystery, for suddenly she lurched backwards into the office and the door slammed too. "'What do you think you're doing?' yelled Mark. "'Let go of me,' said Toffee indignantly. "'I was only making friends.' Mark sighed deeply. And why on earth did you have to wear that? Heaven only knows what they're thinking out there. I know, replied Toffee simply. Mark turned from her in the resignation of despair and suddenly stopped short. Facing him, mouth agape, was Julie Mason. Good, good morning, Julie, he stammered. Good afternoon, Mr. Pillsworth, said Julie absently. Her gaze followed Toffee as she crossed to one of the large upholstered chairs. "'Oh, yes,' said Mark hurriedly. "'Julie, this is Toffee, my, um, my niece. She lost her baggage on the way out and had to wear just what she had left.' He laughed nervously, hoping that the fact that Toffee had seen fit to be caught short in an evening gown might somehow explain itself. "'How do you do?' said Julie icily, noting that Mark was a wretched liar." Toffee peered from the chair to take in the cool blonde Julie. "'Mark has had some lovely thoughts about you,' she said gaily. Julie turned to Mark in bewilderment, but he couldn't think of anything to say. Suddenly she pivoted and rushed from the room. The door didn't exactly slam behind her, but there was no doubt about its being closed. Mark slumped into the chair at his desk and stared forlornly after her. For a time it was quiet in the office until Toffee rose from the chair and crossed to a mirror at the opposite side of the room. Suddenly she turned to Mark. 
Stop that daydreaming, she commanded. You're making me fade. Mark glanced up. Toffee had suddenly turned quite pale. I forgot to tell you, she said earnestly. It isn't just that I disappear when you sleep. I also fade when you daydream. Please stay awake. Mark stared at her in fascination, and his expression became quite thoughtful. A door at the back of the room opened cautiously, and Julie's face appeared in the opening. The models are here for the sheer hosiery ad, she announced. I'll be right out, Julie. Mark swung out of the chair and toward the door. He turned back to Toffee. I'll be back in a moment. Don't leave the office. As Mark entered the hall, he saw Julie going into her office next door. Julie, he called. Yes, Mr. Pillsworth? She turned to him, and for a moment Mark couldn't remember what he had started to say. Would you help me choose a model, please? He asked finally. Julie nodded, and together they crossed to the audition room. Raise your skirts, please, said Julie as they entered. Quickly the girls formed a line and did as they were told. Instantly, Mark's eye was caught by a black skirt at the end of the line, being lifted unnecessarily high. He leaped quickly and caught it just in time. "'Stop that and get out of here!' he hissed. "'Not on your life,' murmured Toffee acidly. "'Any time you go around looking at legs, you'll look at mine, understand?' "'Can't I make you understand that this is a business office?' "'What a business!' Toffee glanced significantly at the line of shapely legs. Get out of here, Mark glanced furtively at Julie. I'll make you a deal, replied Toffee sweetly. Anything. If you'll take me to the swankiest nightclub in town tonight, I'll leave with or without a struggle. However you want it. Yes, yes, anything, said Mark quickly. He took her by the arm and led her past the line of girls. At the door, he turned back to Julie. Will you select one and dismiss the others? Of course. Julie kept her eyes on the models. Quickly, she chose one of the girls, gave her the address of the photographer, and sent the others away. After they had gone, she crossed to the window and stared intently at the city below her. She didn't move for several minutes. Presently, she turned and left the room. Julie wasn't the kind for crying. Isn't it heavenly? sighed Toffee as she surveyed the smart spar club. Mark's feeling was one of unmixed apprehension as he took into account the wayward gleam in her eye. Judging by the pagan display on the dance floor, I should say that this is about as unlike heaven as anything could be, he replied sourly. Well, anyway, the music is good. Mark glanced at the orchestra, a disconsolate group of musicians wedged uncomfortably into a bandstand that appeared more like a jeweler's showcase. These men peered malevolently from their perch and alleviated an obvious resentment for the paying guests by blasting away at them with their instruments as loudly and unrelatedly as possible. One young man with some sort of horn seemed to be nursing in a special grudge, for occasionally he would leave his seat, and coming to the front of the minute platform, set the thing into a squeal that was nothing short of terrifying. Mark looked the people at the tables about theirs, but none of them seemed at all disturbed by this hysterical performance. He shrugged and picked up the bottle from the ice bucket. He had never been a drinking man, but he felt that it might help him to understand what was going on. "'Oh, don't we know her?' asked Toffee suddenly. "'Stop pointing.' Who? The girl just coming in, the one with the white dress and perfectly haunting man. Mark turned and looked in the direction Toffee had indicated. Why, it's Julie, he exclaimed. Who's that with her? Jack Snell. He's an artist with the agency. I never did like him, but he's too good a layout man to lose. I wonder what Julie's doing with him. Ask him over, urged Toffee. Mark raised a hand and wigwagged in their direction. Jack Snell was a born gathering appraiser, and it didn't take him long to catch the signal. As they moved across the floor toward him, Mark couldn't help noticing that Julie looked especially wonderful. This was the first time he had seen her outside of the office, and her white lace dress emphasized all the glamour that her customary business suit suppressed. She looks like something out of a dream, he thought, and then blanched. He revised the thought hurriedly. She looks like something out of real life. Hello? said Jack. He addressed Mark, but looked at Toffee. His face lit up like a pinball machine. Toffee had run up a winning score. "'Oh, yes,' said Mark quickly. "'I want you to meet Toffee, my, um, my cousin.' "'She was your niece earlier today,' Julie said evenly. Mark laughed self-consciously as Jack and Julie seated themselves at the table. Julie turned to Toffee. "'Are you enjoying your visit here?' "'Oh, yes,' replied Toffee with enthusiasm. 
Everyone seems so friendly. Do you know what one man said to me today? I could guess, said Julie flatly. I think we should dance, Jack cut in quickly. Oh, I'd love to, beamed Toffee. They rose and started for the dance floor. Turning, Toffee said, You'll excuse us? She was looking directly at Julie. Did you want to dance? asked Mark without enthusiasm. No, thank you, replied Julie. The floor is much too crowded. That's good. I don't know how very well. You never go out much, do you? That is, you haven't until lately. Why, no, I've been too busy. Until lately. Perhaps that was a mistake. Perhaps, said Julie cryptically as she turned to the dance floor. You're looking very beautiful, said Mark. Am I? Julie continued to look away, but she couldn't restrain a faint smile. Mark found himself with nothing to say, but continued to stare at Julie. He couldn't get over the change in her. His mind wandered off into a lovely imaginary land without nightclubs, in which he and Julie were the only inhabitants. This was extremely unfortunate, for out on the dance floor, Jack Snell suddenly found himself dancing, inexplicably and most embarrassingly, alone. Toffee had suddenly vanished into thin air. He also found himself alarmingly confronted by Mrs. Clarabelle Housing, a matron of tremendous prominence in more ways and places than one. Mrs. Housing understood any misdemeanor perpetrated in the Spray Club as a personal affront to be dealt with personally. After all, it did cast unflattering reflections on her set. "'Young man!' she boomed. "'I wonder if you realize what a disgusting exhibition you are presenting. I should think that if you must get roaring drunk, you could do it somewhere less public.' Jack turned to her dazedly. "'But I had a girl,' he said unhappily. "'I seem to have lost her.' A soft light came into Mrs. Housing's eyes. "'He's gone mad!' she shouted, turning to her partner. He's lost his girl, and it's driven him crazy. If there was anything that put life into Clarabella housing, it was straightening out someone else's life. She looked on Jack with the air of the practical social worker. There, there, son, she roared. Don't take on so about it. I'm sure she wasn't half good enough for you. She placed a beefy arm about his shoulder and nodded to her partner. Everett, we must do something for this poor soul. Everett housing had learned to accept his wife's projects with resigned good humor. Yes, dear, he sighed, and followed obediently as his wife led the hapless Jack from the dance floor. It didn't seem to concern the matron that the dancers were stopping to observe their progress. Back at the table, Julie, noticing the excitement, reached for Mark's sleeve. Something's happening to Jack and Toffee, she cried, jumping up. Mark jolted from his reverie, followed after her. They reached the group on the dance floor just in time to witness Toffee's reappearance. "'What's going on here?' screamed Toffee, confronting Mrs. Housing. "'Please get out of my way,' said Mrs. Housing regally. "'Get out of your way?' Toffee flared. "'You should be ashamed of yourself, picking up a girl's man when her back is turned, and on public dance floors, too, and at your age.' Mrs. Housing seemed to explode. "'How dare you! I should think that you had caused enough trouble. You little floozy!' It was apparent to her that this was the young lady who had unseated Jack's reason. At this point, Jack did, indeed, appear somewhat demented. Through the ensuing uproar, he tried valiantly but vainly to make himself heard, and seemed merely to be babbling to himself. Toffee was beside herself with rage. "'Why, you, you, you old back issue!' she yelled. "'You outside pickup!' She swung her foot behind her and calculated the distance to Mrs. Housing's shin. Unfortunately, her heel caught on the rung of Mr. Kentley's chair." That good gentleman, unconcerned of the tumult raging just behind him, was, at the moment, determinedly offering a toast to his wife on the occasion of their twenty-fifth anniversary. He lifted his glass, and with the words, "'And to you, my dear,' tossed its entire contents neatly into Mrs. Kentley's face. Toffee had jerked the chair swiftly from under him. Mrs. Kentley shot out of her chair with a scream designed for blood-chilling. Across the room, a guest, somewhat befogged by too much drink, raised a heavy head and shouted, Murder! at the top of his lungs. Across from him, his companion looked up with startled eyes and quietly slid under the table unconscious. The man looked down at her without concern. Can't stand the sight of blood, he explained to no one in particular. The center of this excitement suddenly dissipated itself with the stately, if hurried, departure of Mrs. Housing and her obedient husband, but the fever of hysteria had already spread to the remaining guests and was raging unabated. 
The orchestra, caught in the spirit of the occasion, struck up a raucous rendition of the beer barrel polka. Several guests, similarly inspired, wrapped their partners rather urgently over the head with whatever bottles were at hand. The door to the manager's office opened briefly and slammed too. Finally, Mark managed to fight his way through to Toffee. "'Now see what you've done!' he yelled. <laughs> "'So this is nightclubbing!' squealed Toffee delightedly. "'We have to get out of here!' Mark guided her away from the dance floor. "'Just when things were really getting started!' asked Toffee. "'Where are Jack and Julie?' "'They've gone and we'd better do the same.' "'Just a moment,' replied Toffee and disappeared into the crowd again. Mark made a grab for her, but missed. Presently she returned, beaming triumphantly. Under her arm she carried a bottle of champagne— "'I don't see why we should let it go to waste,' she explained. Mark groaned and hurried her off toward the entrance. Outside they were greeted not only by the cool evening air, but also what appeared to be the entire police force. The manager of the spar club stood behind them. "'There they are, boys!' he yelled excitedly. "'Grab em! Toffee was delighted to find herself once more the center of attention. She looked up at the judge with a disarming smile. She felt a little sorry for the poor man. He seemed so perplexed by everything.' Mark stood beside her, wondering vaguely if he weren't dead. And if not, why not? The judge fixed Toffee with a baleful stare. "'Who did you say your parents were?' His voice was that of a martyr. "'A moonlit night and a yearning spirit,' said Toffee blandly. The judge's eyes rolled ceilingward. "'Oh, good Lord,' he sighed in pure supplication. "'What she means,' beamed Mark. "'You stay out of this,' snapped the judge. "'I'll hear from you later.' "'But, Judge,' said Toffee, "'I don't know how I can make it clearer.' "'Never mind,' replied the Judge hotly. "'Let's hear no more about it. "'I sincerely wish I hadn't brought it up in the first place. "'Now perhaps you'll tell me what went on in the spa club this evening. "'And never mind the poetry.' "'Well,' said Toffee brightly, "'it all started when this old fright tried to steal Mr. Snell from me, "'right there on the dance floor, too.' "'An earnest expression crept over her face. "'She should be locked up, Judge.' Mark's thoughts raced wildly. If ever there was a time for Toffee to fade, this was unquestionably it. He clamped his eyes tightly shut and tried frantically to picture peaceful pastoral scenes in an attempt to induce sleep. However, what occurred to him most frequently were bleak countrysides, strewn with assorted wreckage, symbolic of his future. "'Exactly what is your relationship with this man?' The judge nodded in Mark's direction without looking at him. "'Well,' said Toffee, you see, I sort of belong to him, in a way. You mean he's your guardian? This appealed to Toffee, and she nodded vigorously. The judge turned to Mark. Young man, he began, then looked questioningly at Toffee. What's the matter with him? Toffee turned to Mark, and sudden anger flashed in her eyes. You double-crosser, she hissed. Swiftly, her hand shot to Mark's unsuspecting rear, and two fingers closed wickedly. Instantly, Mark's eyes flew open and stared wildly at the judge as a piercing scream rent the courtroom and he leaped frantically forward. A small cry of terror was heard from the frightened judge as he disappeared beneath the bench. "'He's attacking me!' he screamed from the floor. "'Get him out of here! Get them both out of here! Lock them up before they kill someone!' As the two official brutes closed in on them, Mark angrily faced Toffee. "'If you ever do anything like this again, I'll deliberately contract sleeping sickness!' he shouted. Mark awoke, wondering how long he had been asleep, and, in the gray morning light, began to inspect his quarters without enthusiasm. The cell that he occupied was like any other, but he had been lucky enough to have it all to himself. He lay, face up in the lower section of the steel double-decker, and reviewed the preceding night's activities. Suddenly, he started forward and propped himself up on one elbow. There was a form clearly outlined in the mattress above him. He tried to remember if anyone had been brought into the cell during the night. As he was thinking about it, the form stirred. Slowly, he advanced a hand to the mattress and prodded it gingerly. His suspicions were immediately confirmed. "'Good morning,' called Toffee with a hateful cheerfulness as she peered down at him from the upper. "'I thought they put you in the women's quarters.' "'They did, but I decided to materialize here to be with you.' "'But if they find you here—' Mark gave it up. Things couldn't get any worse. "'I hope you're happy about this.' He waved his hand tragically at the cell. Well, said Toffee slowly, I can think of better places. Let's leave. And how do you propose to get out of here? You mean they intend to keep us here? It is likely, considering your performance before the judge last night, that we shall rot in this place. 
We'll just have to get out. Toffee's brow wrinkled sternly. Mark looked grieved, but made no reply. After several moments of concentrated thought, his face lit up. Now look, Toffee, he said. You say that you can materialize anywhere. Suppose I doze off for a while. Do you suppose you could manage to come to outside and get the keys to this trap? After all, they don't have our names, our real ones, on any of the records yet. I could do it with my eyes closed, Toffee cried happily. Well, don't get fancy about it. Mark stretched out on the bed and closed his eyes, and everything became quiet in the cell for a time. Toffee waited expectantly, but nothing happened. Mark swung his legs over the edge of the bed and cupped his chin in his hands. It's no use, he sighed. I've too much on my mind. Try again, urged Toffee. It's no use, I tell you. Toffee sat up and glanced down at Mark. Slowly, an intense expression crept over her face. Quietly, she reached down and removed one of her shoes and regarded it sadly. She leaned over the edge of the bed and poised it over Mark's head. Closing her eyes, she swung the shoe downward as swiftly as she could. Mark slumped to the floor soundlessly. Mark had been right in assuming that Joseph wouldn't be there to open the door for them. He fitted the key into the lock and turned it. You needn't have hit me so hard, he grumbled. Toffee looked hurt. I got you out of there, didn't I? Of course, maybe I shouldn't have left that note for the judge. Mark looked alarmed. What note? Well, the poor dear was so disturbed about my parentage that I left a note explaining the whole thing. I guess it wasn't such a good idea. What did you tell him? That my father was a Welsh. Toffee smiled mysteriously and crossed to inspect herself in the mental mirror. I'm a wreck. You miss me while I fix up a bit. Mark fell into a chair as she left the room. He sat there regarding the apartment listlessly. It seemed to reflect his own life. Orderly, dignified, unexciting, and infinitely lonely. Suddenly his reverie was interrupted by a knock at the door. He crossed and opened it. There, looking particularly miserable, stood Julie. "'I hope you'll excuse my coming here,' she said timidly. "'I've been waiting at the office for you all morning. I tried to call you several times, but there wasn't any answer. I decided to come over and wait for you. It's odd that Joseph didn't answer the phone.' "'He wasn't in,' said Mark. "'Is something wrong?' "'Well, no, not exactly,' Julie hesitated. "'It's just that, well, it's just that... "'I, I want to quit my job with you, Mr. Pillsworth.' What? Mark's eyes widened with surprise. Yes, Mr. Pillsworth, I want to quit. The words came in a rush. Now, today, I don't ever want to have to go back. But you mustn't leave. There was an immediacy in Mark's tone. How would I get on without you? If it's a matter of salary... No, it isn't that. You give me more than enough to get by on. As a matter of fact, I don't know where I'll ever get a better job. Mark looked at her questioningly. Well... I don't know just how to explain it. It's just something that's come over me all of a sudden. I have a strange feeling that I'm wasting my life there as if something were closing in on me to cut me off from everything I really want, as though the job itself were a menace to my happiness. I guess it came over me yesterday when your cousin... Niece, interrupted Mark. When your niece was in the office. She seemed so gay, so much that I should be, but I'm not... It seemed only fair to talk to you first before leaving. Mark glanced nervously toward the bedroom door. But what has the agency to do with it? I wish I knew, said Julie. It's just a feeling that I have. But I can't let you go, Julie. The note of urgency crept back into Mark's voice. And you mustn't envy Toffee. You see, she's just escaping a dull existence herself, and only momentarily. She'll be returning soon. Perhaps right away. A sudden light came into Julie's eyes. Besides, I, I know what you feel. I've felt the same thing myself for years. The trouble was that I let myself get used to it, and after a time I didn't know the difference. I'm sure I know how to help myself now, and I think I could help you too, if you'll let me. If you'll stay. Please don't leave, Julie. As Julie listened to Mark, her expression became softly radiant. Perhaps you're right. Mark, she said quietly. Mark reached out and took her hand in his. Suddenly, from behind the bedroom door came the soft hiss of a shower. Instantly, Julie drew back. Joseph must be back, Mark said quickly. Taking a shower? 
Oh, yes, he often takes showers this time of day. Very clean man. Says cleanliness is next to godliness, or something of the sort. Very clean. Spotless, you might say. Mark began to realize he was babbling and stopped short. Of course, said Julie, smiling. I should have remembered Joseph. It gave me rather a start. I thought we were alone. You'll be back in the morning, then? Mark asked anxiously. Please say you will. Julie regarded Mark thoughtfully. Yes, she said slowly. It doesn't seem now that there was ever anything wrong. She turned toward the door. Julie? Yes, she turned. And as she did so, Mark caught her in his arms. He kissed her briefly and released her, stepping back embarrassedly. Julie smiled up at him for a moment and then said quickly, It's a wonderful job. I wouldn't quit for anything. The door closed softly behind her. When Toffee entered the living room, she found Mark staring out of the window with a curiously foolish grin. She stood beside him for a moment and looked out at the city. "'Go put some clothes on,' he said. Toffee was wrapped in a huge towel, draped precariously over one shoulder. "'What for? At this moment, more of me is covered than at any time since we met.' "'Yes, I guess so.' For a moment they stood silently before the window. "'Toffee,' Mark began. "'Yes, Mark?' "'Why are you here?' What is it you want, really? My wish is for you, Mark. It has been from the beginning. If I've cost you trouble, perhaps it was because you needed it. I'll be returning soon, but I can't help wanting to linger for a while. But how will your return be accomplished? You'll know when the time comes. She smiled up at him. Maybe it's time I put those clothes on after all. She went into the bedroom. Mark slumped into a chair. In a way, he had enjoyed Toffee and her trouble, but... Now she would be in the way. You'll know when the time comes, she had said. He was certain that the time had arrived, but he still hadn't any idea about sending her back to the subconscious. Perhaps it would be best to go back to the beginning. How had it started? He reviewed the strange occurrence over and over again. For the fifth time, he went back to the beginning. Suddenly, he brought his fist down on the arm of the chair. Of course, that's it, he murmured. Her father was a Welsh, he laughed shortly. <laughs> it's so simple. I should have known it all along. After a time, the bedroom door flew open. Toffee was making a grand entrance. As she moved toward him, Mark thought briefly that he had never seen her so beguiling. At the center of the room, she paused. Isn't it wonderful? I like it even more than the black one. You might say it leaves everything to be desired, said Mark. Oh? By some young swain. He added, Mark, there just isn't any hope for you. I'd have agreed with you two days ago. And now? Who knows? I'm sure I don't. That's as it should be. Mark started for the bedroom. I could use a little sprucing up myself. At the door he turned back. Suppose we make a special occasion of dinner tonight. Go somewhere where the food is especially good. I know a place that serves a wonderful Welsh rare bit. I was there just night before last. Toffee's smile immediately disappeared, and for a moment her eyes searched Mark's face, which had suddenly become quite serious. Her smile reappeared as suddenly as it had faded, but it seemed a bit more set. I'm sure I'll love it, she said. Mark spoke slowly, and his voice carried a touch of sadness. And remind me to stop by the drugstore for sleeping tablets. I ran out the other night. Sure, Mark. Toffee looked away toward the window as Mark left the room. The countryside had somehow reassembled itself, as lovely and serene as before, with the blue mist playing about the trees. Toffee and Mark moved down the hillside toward a small valley obscured by the mist. I should be angry with you, said Toffee. You didn't waste any time in sending me back once you knew how. You said I'd know when the time came. How did you find out? I kept wondering where it had all started. And then I remembered that foods sometimes cause certain kinds of dreams. Then, too, I remembered that you had said that your father was a Welsh. I didn't have to be clever to put it all together and get Welsh rare bit, especially since it was the very thing I had eaten the first night. It all seemed pretty silly, but somehow it sort of fitted in with what's happened. You're not angry, are you? He looked down at her affectionately. Of course not, Mark. There's something you've forgotten. I exist only in your mind. I am as you see me, 
If I had stayed longer, if I had come to stand in the way of your happiness, I should have become ugly and wretched. I've served my purpose, and it's time for me to return. Really, you haven't so much to do with it as you suppose. It's been a wonderful adventure for me, Mark. I'm glad, Toffee, Mark said simply. I'll never forget what you've done for me. Just remember, Mark, that I'm not so unlike other ordinary women. There is none of us who can remain lovely unless she does so in the eyes of a man whom she loves. Be good to Julie. You knew about Julie? Of course, laughed Toffee. I knew from the beginning before you did. I know more about you than you do yourself. That's another point I hold in common with other women. They had reached the edge of the valley, and suddenly Toffee stopped. This is where I have to leave you, she smiled up at Mark. Suddenly he took her in his arms, very tenderly, and kissed her. As he released her, the bell began to ring in the distance, as it had before. Goodbye, Toffee said softly, starting toward the valley. As she moved, the earth seemed to dissolve behind her, leaving a narrow chasm between them. With each step, the bell became more and more distinct. Suddenly, impulsively, Mark turned toward her. Wait, he called, and reached out a hand to her. Mark's hand fell to the alarm clock, and he awakened to a bright new morning with a vague sense of loss. Suddenly, he swung his legs over the edge of the bed and got to his feet. Julie would be at the office. He didn't want to be late. End of Section 1. I'll Dream of You Section 2 of The Early Misadventures of Toffee by Charles F. Myers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker You Can't Scare Me! Part 1. Whether or not they had passed through the portals of Earl Carroll's, the girls that threaded their way daily through the offices of Mark Pillsworth's advertising agency were undeniably some of the most beautiful in the world. It was probably this abundance of beauty more than anything else that caused Mark to shun the more seamy things in life. It was this also that made it so doubly unbearable that, nine times out of ten, every time his office door opened, it was only to admit to his presence one of nature's most vulgar experiments with American womanhood. What Mark, by marrying Julie, had gained in a wife, he had quite certainly lost in a secretary. Miss Quirt closed the door primly and turned to face Mark, very easily the nastiest thing she could possibly have done to anyone. As always, just to add stark horror to the picture, she smiled and revealed to her unappreciative employer that she had accomplished the extremely doubtful triumph of whitewashing the old-fashioned cow-catcher, without in any way detracting from its accustomed appearance of upswept grandeur. The proof of this lay in the sudden appearance of her amazing teeth. As the tight, dry skin of her face drew back to reveal this hideous accomplishment, it was hard to believe that the accompanying creaking sound that echoed through the room was only a trick of the imagination. "'Yes, Mr. Pillsworth,' she inquired, and thereby added to this already astonishing display of hideosities the horror of her voice— which held all the melody of a palsied hand searching vainly for the key of E on a rusty guitar. Mark shuddered and quickly turned his gaze to a strip of oak paneling, which had suddenly become, to him, an object of indescribable loveliness. He had only lately come to know why Julie had insisted on the employment of Miss Quirt. The very qualities which he now found so repulsive had been, to his wife, the attributes that made the woman so desirable for the job. It might as well be admitted that Julie had become unreasonably jealous of Mark's association with a group of girls that seemed to her pretty stiff competition for the most glamorous glamour chorus in town, let alone herself. Well, Mark said with false heartiness, today is the day, Miss Quirt. Will you please bring me the layouts for the Reese campaign? I'm going to submit them this afternoon. You have the key to that file, I believe. He tried hard not to hear her answering rasp and heaved a sigh of relief as he heard the door close. The signal that this horribly jarring note had once more, at least momentarily, gone out of his life. When she returned, it was not quite so bad. This time, he had the contents of the briefcase to distract him. It was important that the layouts be complete. His hands ran over them almost lovingly, a full year's advertising material for the most sensational medical product ever to be offered to a suffering public. Old Gregory Reese really had something this time. A cure-all to end all cure-alls, and one that was the real McCoy into the bargain. It did everything that the old-time medicine doctor claimed, and a good deal more as well. 
and that was the very thing that made the drug's initial presentation to the public so difficult. It was too wonderful to be true. Reese had been cagey in asking all the agencies to submit advertising campaigns. That way, he would be certain to get just the right publicity slant, since this was easily to be the largest account to be had by any agency ever. It would make the agency that got it, and quite likely break the ones that didn't. The firm handling this Reese product would be able to pick and choose the rest of its clients, and Mark was well aware that if the Mays agency, his most formidable competitors, beat him out on it, they would hesitate considerably less than a second to pick and choose the very accounts which he himself was now handling. However, he was not disturbed. The campaign that his boys had turned out was just the ticket. Honest, imaginative, and convincing. Besides that, he was already handling a number of other Reese products with considerable success. Confidently, he slid the material back into the briefcase and rose from his chair. It was then that he noticed that the room was still haunted by the specter of the outer office. "'Is there something else, Miss Quirt?' he asked stiffly. "'Yes, sir. Mrs. Pillsworth called to say that she would meet you here for lunch.' "'You told her that I would be out, didn't you?' "'No, sir.' "'What?' "'I didn't tell her, sir,' Miss Quirt shrilled half-wittedly. "'She will always make a fuss about those things. She always thinks that you—' "'I wasn't aware that Mrs. Pillsworth was causing you so much trouble.' Mark cut in sarcastically. I'll have to speak to her about it. In the meantime, Miss Quirt, call her back and say that I'll be tied up in some very important business during the lunch hour. There was sincere concern in Mark's eyes as he picked up his hat and left the room. Julie's jealousy was fast becoming an office scandal. Something would certainly have to be done about it, he thought, as he hurried through the outer office down the steps and out onto the sidewalk. This ugly facet in Julie's otherwise completely beguiling nature still had a firm grip on his thoughts as... At the sound of the traffic signal, he stepped from the curb into the street. The city, in this quiet, pausing moment just before the noon rush, seemed almost too serene. In the midday sun, the usually busy intersection had become almost unnaturally still. Perhaps it was this stillness that made the scream appear so dreadfully shrill. It was a scream that, like a certain cough medicine, came with a three-way action, ear-splitting, hair-raising, and nerve-wracking. Mark stopped short and spun quickly around to discover the source of this dismaying performance. What met the eye didn't match up at all. He wouldn't have been a bit surprised to have seen a banner stretched across the intersection with the query, What's wrong with this picture? written across it. As it was, the girl simply stood there on the sidewalk and yelled her head off for no apparent reason whatever. If there had been a man with an evil-looking glint in his eye running either from or toward her, it made no matter which, there might have been some reason for this wretched recital but there was not. Suddenly the girl unbelievably increased her volume and pointed directly at Mark. It was then that he heard the automobile behind him. He turned just in time to receive a montage impression of flashing chromium, black enamel, and spinning wheels, all headed squarely in his direction. What happened after that was a bit confused, except for the one clear fact that the pavement, apparently overcome with a mad desire to have a better view of Mark's face, was rushing impetuously toward it, it may have been this topsy-turvy indifference to the natural laws of gravity that dislodged the manhole cover, but, whatever it was, a dark black hole had instantly appeared in the center of the street, and Mark was unaccountably plunging headfirst into it. As he descended into the thick darkness of the hole, he had no sensation of fear, however. He was falling slowly, almost floating downward, and his occasional contact with it told him that he was moving through a sort of cylinder the wall of which was of a consistency that brought to mind a sort of soft sponge rubber. Indeed, he had almost begun to enjoy his mishap, when he came easily to rest on what apparently was the bottom. This time his hands came in contact with a different substance. He seemed to be lying on a small plot of grass. As though his landing there had been the signal for it, a thin rim of bright light appeared evenly around the bottom of the dark tube, and began to widen steadily. As Mark looked up to discover down what passage he had come, he realized that it was withdrawing into what appeared to be a cloudless blue sky, and instantly his attention was drawn to his immediate surroundings. There was something familiar about the tranquil little valley with its emerald greenness and its soft blue mist that gave everything a shimmering chiffon-like softness. It was like a place long forgotten that once remembered would surely recall happy memories. Mark got to his feet and turned to the tree that stood, alone and lovely, behind him. Then suddenly... He started back in alarm. The tree seemed to have given bud to a pair of extremely well-shaped legs. Well, it's about time, 
Toffee said shrewishly, peering out at him from the foliage. You've no idea how bored I've been, just sitting around in this awful stately mind of yours. I don't see how you can stand the silly thing yourself. Don't you ever think of anything off-color, something I could really get my teeth into? Mark stared at her in dismay as she swung lightly out of the tree. Her red hair, caught by the breeze, seemed like flame. Good grief, she continued fretfully. I've been sitting around up here, waiting for you for so long I've nearly gotten middle-aged spread. Mark quickly closed his eyes as she prepared to prove this statement. I'll take your word for it, he cried hurriedly. Toffee's deep green eyes suddenly came alight as she grinned. Oh, all right, you hypocritical old Puritan, she said affectionately. Now that you're here, I might as well admit I'm glad to see you again. She started toward him. Kiss me and say hello. In that order. Mark's hand was instantly raised in defense. Oh, no, he cried. We're not going to have any more of that. It just leads to trouble. Toffee looked grieved. You haven't changed a bit, she said disappointedly. And that isn't all, Mark replied evenly. I'm not going to change either. When I think of the way you messed things up for me last time, my flesh fairly crawls. You're going to have to sit this one out alone. Toffee smiled mysteriously. Don't you bet any money on that, she said confidently. Anyway, it won't hurt anything if we just talk over old times, will it? She motioned toward the tree. Let's sit down. You look tired. Slowly and definitely against his better judgment, Mark started in Toffee's direction. Then suddenly he stopped short. Run! Run! boomed the voice. It didn't seem to come from anywhere in particular. It was just in the air. Even the mist seemed to stir under its heavy tone. Run! Run! It repeated, and Mark, not knowing clearly why, felt an impelling urge to follow its commanding advice. Suddenly, in the grip of an unknown panic, he was running without direction or reason until, in the influence of an impulse, he looked back over his shoulder. The black cylinder, now flexible, was twisting and turning after him, gaining on him at every step. Frantically, he increased his speed, in spite of the disturbing presence of Toffee, now that he had found his way back to the peaceful valley, he was reluctant to leave it. He tried desperately to dodge as he saw the mouth of the dark passage almost directly overhead, yawning threateningly. Then, resignedly, he knew it was no use. It had followed him, and was already shutting away the light of the valley. "'Run! Run!' the voice continued vainly, but edging its way through was also the voice of Toffee. "'Wait! Wait for me!' she screamed, and suddenly, impetuously, Mark was holding a hand out to her through the remaining free space. All of a sudden, the tube closed over them with a dreadful sucking sound, and they were being lifted upward, Toffee clinging to Mark desperately as though for her very life. The upward journey, thought Mark, was to be very like the descent, except for the accompanying sound of the voice, as it repeated over and over, Run! Run! Hit and run, someone was saying. This guy on the wrong end of it got it right in the middle of the street. According to his identification, his name is Pillsworth. He's not really hurt, just bruised up a little. Then a door closed somewhere, and a distinctly antiseptic smell was whispering to Mark that he was in the receiving room of a hospital. He lay still and kept his eyes closed for a moment. His head had become the uneasy air to a dull, throbbing feeling. After a moment of silent consideration, he opened his eyes and then closed them quickly. He could have sworn that he had seen Toffee smiling down at him. But that was impossible. It couldn't possibly happen twice in one lifetime to the same man. Not one that drank as little as he did, anyway. In another moment, however, a pair of warm lips were pressed firmly against his own, to tell him that it not only could happen, but had. In a moment of utter helplessness, he did not resist. "'Well, that's more like it,' Toffee said happily. Mark immediately became starkly upright on the slab-like examination table, and at once Toffee's wayward mode of dress was forcibly recalled to him. She still wore the same filmy, transparent scrap of material— and it, for its part, still seemed to cling to her remarkable figure reluctantly, as though having urgent business elsewhere. It was a material that could conceivably be put to a wide variety of uses, but it was unfortunate that not one of these uses was, in the remotest way, connected with the coverage of the human body. You, 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 no, Mark sputtered incoherently. No? asked Toffee. No, you can't be here, Mark gasped. It isn't right. You'll just have to go back to where you came from. Toffee's expression swiftly became that of the patient martyr. Do I have to explain it to you every time? She asked. You know perfectly well that I've materialized from your subconscious, 
and I can't possibly return until the proper time, whenever that is. I promise faithfully to disappear when you sleep or lose consciousness. Then I have to go back. But until my mission is accomplished, I have to keep right on materializing during every one of your waking hours. I do wish you'd get used to the idea. Mark winced perceptibly. Your, your mission? he asked. Of course, Toffee said. You men are all alike, just a pack of selfish dogs. You must have needed me for something or you wouldn't have dreamed me up again. But you can't stay this time, Mark wailed. I'm a married man now. Oh, don't let that bother you. Toffee said reassuringly. I don't mind a bit. In fact, I think it's lovely for you to be married. Mark leaned defeatedly back on the table and buried his face in his hands. Oh, no, no, he murmured mournfully. Then he sat up quickly as a voice sounded from just outside the door. Is this the right room? it asked. Is this where you put Pillsworth? Then there followed a silence in which another unseen being apparently answered. Holy smoke, Mark whispered. You've got to get out of here. If they find you in here like that, all hell will break loose. His eyes searched the room frantically and finally came to grateful rest on a white cloth covered screen in the far corner. He pointed quickly to it. Get behind that! What for? hissed Toffee, placing a slender hand defiantly on a round, smooth hip. Why do you always want me to hide just when a man comes round? Don't argue, Mark said threateningly. Get behind that screen. Oh, all right, Toffee pounded but I think you're just a killjoy. Slowly she crossed the room and slid behind the screen just as the door opened to admit one of the tallest interns Mark had ever seen. In his white uniform, he looked like one of the chalk cliffs of Dover, and his ruddy face might well have been the sun rising over that cliff. Well, Mr. Pillsworth, he called with hateful professional joviality, I see that we're up. How are we feeling after our little accident? Were you in it too? Mark asked dryly but the young man was not to be set aside with so trivial a rebuke. He, with his silly smile, thought Mark had probably attended patients for years that hated his very guts. "'We were very lucky,' the fellow continued offensively. "'Were we?' "'Yes, you haven't really been hurt at all. According to the report, you've no internal injuries and only a few bruises that won't show at all since they're located—' "'Never mind,' Mark cut in hastily, glancing toward the screen. "'I'll find out where they are for myself.' The intern lounged his way across the room and dangerously rested his arm on the top edge of the screen. Mark wondered if he were going to have a relapse. He almost wished he were still unconscious. I'll... I'll be permitted to leave the hospital, won't I? He asked shakily. The young man nodded. You're perfectly all right. You'll just need to take it easy for a day or so. We might have kept you here for observation, but the hospital's too crowded. We tried to call your wife, but she was out. Fine, said Mark. And where is my briefcase? Briefcase? The fellow asked stupidly. Yes, briefcase, the one I was carrying when I was hit. But there wasn't any. Mark felt a rush of terror which subsided almost immediately. It had probably been taken back to the office. After all, his name and address were all over the thing. Then, once again, his heart leaped to his throat and the briefcase was forgotten, as he saw the intern's hand slip lazily behind the screen. Mark needn't have worried himself about what was going to happen, for it happened instantly, and no one could have prevented it anyway. The young man's red face turned an extravagant shade of deep purple as his anguished cry rang out through the room like a call from the damned. Moaning wretchedly, he bent double and pressed his injured hand between his knees. The screen tottered drunkenly for a moment, and then clattered to the floor to reveal Toffee engaged in a half-won battle to wedge herself into a stiffly starched nurse's uniform. The fire of virtuous outrage that blazed in Toffee's eyes as she stepped over the screen forced her arm through a reluctant sleeve, clearly implied that, compared to her, Elsie Dinsmore was nothing more than a loose living slattern. "'You bit me!' the intern wailed. "'You bet I did!' snapped Toffee. "'And next time you come groping around where I'm dressing with those great hammy paws of yours, I'll gnaw them off clear up to the elbows!' In the face of such heated self-righteousness, the young man could hardly doubt her statement. Obviously, he was being tormented by the picture of himself, continuing armless through the remainder of his life. "'I'm sorry,' he said contritely, apparently forgetting that, in view of the excellent nurse's quarters just upstairs, the indignant girl had chosen a rather singular place to dress. "'You should be,' Toffee replied icily. "'If it happens again, I'll report you.' And without waiting for an answer, she started regally from the room. 
Button that dress, Mark yelled inadvertently. Button your lip, Toffee replied composedly, disappearing around the edge of the door. Mark wished desperately that he could go after her. There was no telling what she might do. He only knew that having Toffee back was merely a matter of traveling the shortest road to utter confusion at the highest rate of speed. He shivered at the thought of what doubtless lay ahead. As Mark swung out of the hospital door, the last brilliant rays of a dying sun almost blinded him for a moment. And he didn't see Toffee at first, sitting there on the steps, chin in hand, and looking very much like a completely thoughtless rendition of the thinker. "'What kept you so long?' she asked irritably. "'I had to sign some papers.' Mark explained. It's too bad that no one got the license number on the car that hit me. It would have... Suddenly he stopped and stared at Toffee, mouth agape. The white uniform that he had last seen her in had miraculously been replaced in part by a black evening gown that had obviously seen hell at the ruthless hand of its cutter. It had hardly a back to call its own, and as for the front, instead of covering Toffee's amazing figure, it seemed merely to draw a heavy black line around it for emphasis. A look of pain came into Mark's eyes. "'Where did you get that?' he asked weakly. Toffee motioned vaguely across the street. "'At that store over there,' she answered serenely. "'I charged it to you,' Mark groaned. "'What was the matter with the uniform? I thought it was very neat.' "'Wasn't it, though?' Toffee replied disdainfully. "'It's no wonder all the people in the hospital are sick. It's enough to make anyone ill just having to look at a woman all trussed up in one of those starch-ridden atrocities.' She pivoted on the steps, and a shimmering black cloud moved gracefully above her lovely legs. Isn't it a dream? Yes, Mark said emphatically. A perfect nightmare. You look like something that should be raided and hauled off to headquarters. Why, if Julie... A sudden chill lodged itself in his spine. Holy smoke, let's get out of here! Unceremoniously, he took her by the arm and rushed her down the length of the steps to a taxi that was luckily standing idle in the hospital drive. As they approached it, an aged head looking not unlike a mildewed melon jutted from the driver's window, and two faded eyes widened with surprise. From wrinkled lips, a thin whistle sounded feebly into the dimming day. "'That's what I like about this world,' Toffee said, getting into the cab. "'Everyone seems so happy. At least the men do. They're always whistling.' "'Oh, I remember this place,' Toffee said as Mark opened the door to the agency. "'I wish you didn't,' Mark said flatly. Without a memory, you're a terror. With one, you're a positive menace. He swung the door wide and motioned toward the steps. Get in there, out of sight. And waste this beautiful dress? She asked disappointedly. I thought you were taking me out somewhere. You were wrong, Mark said shortly. And besides, that dress has already been wasted until there's hardly anything left of it. It's indecent. <laughs> yes, I know, giggled Toffee, starting up the steps. For a moment, they continued in silence until Mark suddenly stopped short. There was a light burning just beyond the head of the stairs. "'Wait a minute,' he commanded. "'Miss Quirt is still up there. The efficiency of that female is enough to make your blood run cold, and she's got a mind like a clogged-up cesspool. If she gets a load of you in that dress, it'll be a public scandal by morning.' "'What are we going to do?' asked Toffee. Mark considered this for a moment and came to a decision. "'We're going on up,' he said determinedly. But you'll have to stay behind me. Stick to me like wallpaper. Toffee nodded enthusiastically. Sticking to Mark like wallpaper seemed to be her fondest dream. She stood aside to let him pass. The minute Mark stepped into the outer office and to the presence of Miss Quirt, he realized the error of his instructions to Toffee. In her effort to stick to him, she was also treading on his heels, and Mark, never too sure-footed anyway, found himself romping helplessly across the office with all the self-conscious abandon of a performing porpoise. Miss Quirt, still at her desk, looked up in alarm, her pale eyes filled with wonder. "'Mr. Pillsworth!' she squeaked. Mark, without answering her, lunged drunkenly toward the door to his office like a drowning man grasping for a lifeline. Reaching it, he drew it open, careful to continue facing Miss Quirt, and swung his free arm behind him with all the feeble strength he had left. A soft rustling sound told him that Toffee, willy-nilly, was safely out of sight. He said a silent prayer of thanks as he noted that the office was dark. "'Hello, Miss Quirt,' he said, smiling stiffly. "'I just dropped in to pick up my briefcase.' "'Your briefcase?' Unexpectedly from behind, slender fingers were digging lightly into Mark's ribs, and all of a sudden he was giggling helplessly. "'Yes,' he simpered like a feeble-minded schoolboy. My, my, my briefcase. 
His hands crossed violently in midair and came down to his sides with a resounding slap. Miss Quirt, taking all this in with horrified eyes, seemed in acute danger of leaping over her desk and making a run for it. "'Mr. Pillsworth!' she cried. Mark immediately sobered as the fingers withdrew. "'I was parted from my briefcase in an accident,' he explained hopefully. "'I thought it might have been returned here.' "'He's been parted from a lot more than his briefcase,' Miss Quirt murmured desperately to herself. "'Well?' Mark demanded. "'Is it here or not?' "'It is not,' the miserable woman answered decisively. And what's more, Mr. Reese called to say that if you didn't have your campaign in his office by morning, it wouldn't be considered. She seemed almost glad to announce this piece of bad news. Mark's expression became darkly grave, and then, unaccountably, it seemed, changed to one of high-hearted glee as the unseen fingers played lightly over his ribs for a second time. Miss Quirt clutched frantically at the edge of the desk to keep from slipping to the floor. "'You do that once more,' she gasped, "'and I'll scream!' The annoying fingers withdrew, and Mark's eyes filled with distaste. "'You needn't,' he said evenly. "'You couldn't be safer, believe me.' As he swung about to slam the door after him, however, he caught a glimpse of the dreadful woman, scurrying out of the office like an unbalanced scorpion. It was a mistake that Mark started across the room without first turning on the lights, for his very first step brought him in violent contact with Toffee and the darkened room instantly became the sounding board for a series of scrambling, grunting noises that were far from reassuring. "'Let go of me!' Toffee shrieked as she hit the floor. "'Get your heel out of my ear and maybe I can!' Mark rasped furiously. In the ensuing mad scramble to let go of each other, they became so helplessly entangled that finally, in desperation, they both gave up. It was in this edifying moment that the room suddenly became ablaze with light. Mark looked up to find Toffee sitting rigidly upright on his chest, her gaze directed at a chair across the room, her eyes filled with horror. For an awful moment the room became starkly silent as Julie rose from the chair and stared down at them. Her blue eyes gave Mark a graphic description of a glacial age that he had thought long dead. The light flashed in her blonde hair as she lowered her face to Toffee's. "'Get off my husband, you nasty little harpy!' she rasped. Dazedly, Toffee did as she was told, and Julie turned her attention to Mark. "'And as for you, you double-dealing ogre, get up off that floor and stop looking like the less intelligent half of a seal act. And you needn't bother saying that she's your cousin, either. I've heard that one before. Even your family couldn't produce anything that depraved. She probably has a police record that would stretch from here to Shanghai.' "'I have nothing to hide,' Toffee put in elegantly, refusing to accept this blot on her character." Julie's answering gaze lingered malignantly on the black dress. "'Lucky for you,' she said caustically. "'You'd be in a real rotten spot for it if you did.' "'But, Julie, you don't understand,' Mark cried, disentangling his long legs and getting uncertainly to his feet. "'I've understood for longer than you think,' Julie cried angrily. "'I've always suspected that this sort of thing was going on around here, and when you broke our luncheon date, I thought I'd come down to find out the reason.' I knew if I waited around long enough, something would turn up. Mark turned beseechingly to Toffee. Tell her, he pleaded. Tell her I'm a good husband. Toffee, flattered at being invited to take such an important part in this domestic drama, turned beamingly to Julie. You just don't know what a wonderful husband you have, she announced innocently. I dare say, fumed Julie, and some day when you're not too exhausted from frisking around on the floor with him... Suppose you drop around and tell me all about it. She doesn't know what she's saying, Mark cried. Don't ever tell her, Julie said with false sweetness, or you'll ruin some of the liveliest testimony ever written into a court record. Court record? The divorce courts do keep records, don't they? Divorce? The echo of Mark's cry was still in the air as Julie crossed to the door. Yes, divorce, Mark Pillsworth, she said, turning back. And I do mean you. But, but you haven't any grounds, Mark said hopefully. Don't worry about that, Julie replied, opening the door. By the time I get to court, I'll have more grounds than a national park. The slam of the door put a very definite end to the discussion. Mark and Toffee stared dumbly at each other as the angry tap of Julie's heels retreating through the outer office and down the stairs sounded dimly back to them through the closed door. Toffee dropped limply into an upholstered chair and drew her feet up under her. I just can't understand it, she said contentedly. I just can't understand how your mind could be so dull when your life is so exciting. 
Oh, my life is a perfect scream, Mark smoldered. Only, I save up the good parts for you when you're around to enjoy them. They seem better that way. <laughs> you're sweet, Mark, Toffee replied sincerely. Mark looked at her unbelievingly. I just don't know how it happened, he said quietly. Except for that hideous old crow out there in the main office, everything was perfectly tip-top this morning. Now, all of a sudden, my wife is suing me for divorce, my most important advertising copy is missing, and if I don't find it by morning, my business is just as good as ruined. Where did it all start? He dropped dejectedly into the chair behind his desk and rested his chin in his hand. Once again, the room became silent. It was that blonde, he said absently after a moment. What blonde? Toffee asked suspiciously, peering from the depths of her chair. The blonde that screamed. She was a decoy. She double-crossed me. They'll do it every time, Toffee said firmly. Now, you take a redhead. Never mind that, Mark said pensively. She started screaming long before she could have possibly seen the car from where she was standing. She drew my attention away deliberately so I'd be sure to get hit. I'm sure of it. She probably took the briefcase, too. Maybe she was hired for the job. Good grief. If that's true, I'm really in a spot. They'll do it every time, those blondes, Toffee repeated doggedly. I'm sure my briefcase was stolen, Mark said almost to himself. I've got to find that blonde. And in the meantime, just to be sure, I'd better have the boys knock out another campaign tonight. He turned to the telephone and started to dial feverishly. After fifteen minutes of assorted telephone conversations, Mark turned to Toffee dispiritedly. It's no use, he announced. Every last one of them has been called out of town for the weekend. I've never talked to so many simple-minded wives and landladies in all my life. They haven't any idea of where any of the men are. They would pick a time of crisis to start their weak-minded cavorting. Who would want to keep you from having the Reese account? Toffee asked. The Mays Agency, Mark answered promptly, and then shook his head. But Mays wouldn't do a thing like this. He's hard as nails when it comes to business, but he wouldn't do anything criminal. And I might have been killed by that car this morning. What am I going to do now? His question was promptly answered by the shrill ring of the telephone. He picked up the receiver disinterestedly, and before he could give his name, a sultry feminine voice sounded over the wire. This Mark Pillsworth? it asked. Yes, who's this? Don't you mind who this is, Buster? the voice said evenly. Just you listen to what I got to say, and don't interrupt. If you want your briefcase back, you be at the South Lawn Cemetery at eleven sharp tonight. What? Mark yelled. This was a great deal more than he had expected. Yeah, the voice laughed. It's just like a kidnapping. In other words, if you want to see your brainchild alive and healthy again, you be at the cemetery, like I said, with a million dollars in cash. A million? Mark choked. But that's impossible! Yeah, I know, the voice replied conversationally. It's the craziest thing I ever heard of myself. I nearly died laughing when they told me. It's impossible to raise a million in one night, even with a full moon. I know, I tried. But, but, sputtered Mark. No but about it, Buster, the voice said. Them's the orders. And, oh yes, at the risk of sounding corny, I gotta tell you to have the bills in small denominations and unmarked. Ain't that a scream? Suddenly the phone went dead, and Mark looked up dazedly. I just can't believe it, he groaned. I must be dreaming. What's wrong? asked Toffee. That isn't already. I, I've been kidnapped, Mark said wonderingly. I, I, I mean, they're holding my briefcase for ransom. Who is? I don't know. It was a woman that called, probably the blonde. She was undoubtedly paid off to make the phone call, too. I'm pretty sure it's someone else that has the copy. But the blonde is a lead, Toffee pointed out. Yes, Mark agreed. I've simply got to get a hold of that girl. You go around getting hold of any girls, Toffee warned, and I'll be down on you like the wrath of the gods. You'd better hire yourself a detective. Mark stared at her thoughtfully. That's not a bad idea, he said finally. Of course it isn't, Toffee replied proudly. You stick to me and I'll have everything straightened out in jig time. Jig time, Mark corrected automatically, drawing a soiled newspaper from his desk drawer. For a moment, he thumbed through the wrinkled sheets and then folded it back at the classified section. His hand traced slowly down the print-filled columns for a time, then 
quickly darted to the opposite page. There she is, he yelled. Toffee glanced suspiciously about the room. Where? she demanded. Here. As Mark held out the newspaper, his finger indicated an advertisement in the entertainment section. The Loma Club, it read, where you can lose a weekend and never miss it. Under that curious legend was the picture of an overlush blonde young lady, whose name, according to the ad, was Ruby Marlowe. The picture had apparently been taken during one of her performances at the club, for her mouth was wide open. Toffee gazed at the picture critically. That's just the way she looked on the street, Mark said. I don't think you were hit by a car after all, Toffee said sourly. A face like that would stop anything. Well, at least we know where to start, Mark said enthusiastically. We're going to the Loma Club. A detective would take too long. Night clubbing? Toffee asked happily. Wait till I find me a club. I remember the last time. It was heavenly. This isn't going to be like the last time, Mark said sternly. If you start another riot, I'll break your neck with my own bare hands. The inner sanctum of the Loma Club appeared to be a more murky den, designed especially for barbaric rituals than a place for relaxation and entertainment. To confirm this impression, the orchestra platform, when in use, proved to be nothing more than an altar upon which a tiny group of exhausted, down-and-out musicians offered up, in horrible though bloodless sacrifice, the popular tunes of the day. High priestess of these gory activities and hiding under the title of vocalist was Ruby Marlowe. At the moment, she was holding a battered microphone in a death grip that may or may not have accounted for the nerve-wracking, strangled sounds that were issuing from it. To Mark and Toffee, sitting at a table in a dark corner, the amplification of Miss Marlowe's horrible mouthings was simply incredible. Lose a weekend? Toffee said bitterly. You'd fairly murder the poor thing in here. In fact, the whole atmosphere in this place is pretty murderous. She shoved her glass disdainfully away. When I want embalming fluid, I'll go to a mortician. But come to think of it, maybe the waiter knows best after all. One more of those and I'll be dead as a flounder anyway. I wish I hadn't even tasted the first one, Mark said morosely. I keep seeing things. What sorts of things? Mark pointed to a vacant table about a yard from theirs. I think it's haunted, he said. I keep seeing a little man down there. It's awful. Toffee looked in the direction he indicated. I don't see anything, she said reassuringly. It's just an ordinary table with a tablecloth on... Suddenly she stopped speaking and turned frighteningly pale. Slowly a scrawny hand appeared at the edge of the cloth and lifted it. Then, as if that weren't enough, a wrinkled ferret-like face jutted from under it, peered out querulously for a moment, and quickly disappeared. The singular performance was followed by a series of quick clicking sounds that were totally inexplicable. "'Lord, love me!' cried Toffee. "'I saw it, too, and it was horrible. Is that all it does? Just peer out and click at you?' "'Isn't that enough?' Mark answered dumbly. "'It's happened three times now.' "'Maybe he's a bashful castanet player,' Toffee suggested uncertainly. "'I don't think so,' Mark answered gravely. "'I think it's the liquor.' If I start to order again, stuff your napkin down my throat. They both had become so engrossed in the phenomenon of the adjoining table that neither of them noticed the approaching Miss Marlowe. That the murderess of innocent songs was full-blown was unmistakable even at the distance of the microphone, but close up she looked like something that should be turned on side and hung over a bar. You, Mr. Pillsworth? she asked lazily. One of the boys says you want to talk to me. That's right. Mark says, looking up. Please sit down, he gestured toward Toffee. This is Miss, uh, Miss... Don't embarrass yourself, Mr. Pillsworth, cut in Ruby, turning an appraising eye on Toffee. I know the type. They don't come with names, just sizes. She smiled maliciously. And what's yours in mink coats, dear? Toffee's answering gaze dwelt indolently on Miss Marlowe's expanding hips. About five smaller than yours in girdles, hun, she said sweetly. With all the callousness of the seasoned warrior, Ruby accepted this retort, and eased the objects that had inspired it into a vacant chair. She leaned forward and smiled at Mark. What can I do for you? she asked coyly. I like your singing, Mark lied with apparent irrelevance. I'm so glad to hear it. Ruby was all graciousness as she said it. For the first time in your life, Toffee appended viciously. 
But I like it even better in the open air, Mark said evenly. Your street singing left me with quite an impression. Gone were the days of Ruby's innocence, but she wasn't above trying to look lamb-like when the occasion seemed to demand it. She did so now. I don't know what you're talking about, she said. Okay, Mark countered. We'll skip that. But who are you working for? You heard me, Ruby said, trying to look indignant. I don't know what you're talking about. From where I'm sitting, it just sounds like the wind whistling through the holes in your head. Stop the kidding, Mark demanded. I know you took the briefcase, and I intend to have it back. Where is it? Search me, said Ruby. If he does, put in Toffee, I'll scratch his eyes out. Ruby turned on Toffee a searing gaze that knocked in her teeth, tore the gown from her back, and left her bent and bleeding in a dark alley. I'm getting out of here, she announced, pushing back her chair. You're both nuts. It was Mark's guess that the flamboyant Miss Marlowe would probably be considered a flop in her own social set without a police record, and took a chance on it. Just a minute, he said. There are a few boys on the force that would like to know where you are since, since you've dyed your hair, and if you don't level off right now, I'll have them on you like a swarm of flies. Ruby settled back in her chair immediately. Okay, okay, she said. You don't have to yell about it. I'll tell you the whole thing. After all, I was only hired to go downtown and yell like crazy and pick up any loose briefcases I happen to see lying around. There's nothing illegal in that. Who hired you? Ruby glanced nervously around the room and then suddenly smiled. All right, she said pleasantly. I'll tell you. You see that guy sitting over there? The rough-looking bird in the opposite corner? That's Manny Grout, the racketeer. He hired me. Mark glanced briefly over his shoulder and shuddered. Manny Grout was the sort of fellow no one would ever suspect of having had a mother. He seemed to have been assembled rather than born. In front of him, the table looked like a delicate footrest. What does he want with my briefcase? Mark asked uneasily. Search me, Ruby said easily. The ransom, I suppose. You ask him to search you just once more, Toffee broke in menacingly, and I'll break your bottle of peroxide. That's enough, bawled Ruby. That's the shot that got me. Stand up and I'll tear that red hair out by the roots. And don't think I can't do it, either. I've got Irish blood in my veins. And if you'd like it splashed all over the floor where you can show it off better, Toffee flared, just start something. Ruby, an affable creature by nature, and always open to suggestions of all kinds, took Toffee at her word and lifted her none too daintily from her chair. Stop that! yelled Mark, and rushing to the struggling women took a bare shoulder in each hand. No sooner did he have them parted than, as if by magic, a huge meaty hand fell on Mark's shoulder and nearly weighted him to the floor. Oh, murder! he murmured as he looked up into the terrifying face of Manny Grout, which at the moment bore an expression that did little toward inspiring open-hearted confidence and trust. You named it right, bud, Manny rumbled ominously. I don't like guys pawing my girlfriend. End of Section 2 You Can't Scare Me, Part 1《Of the Early Misadventures of Toffee》by Charles F. Myers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. You Don't Scare Me, Part 2. In the following moments, Ruby and Manny looked like rather grotesque members of a water ballet, as, in perfect unison, they held their victims at bay and drew back their fists. To anyone else, in Toffee's very potent position, Ruby's doubled fist would have been an item of consuming interest, but to Toffee it was a forgotten detail as her attention fell on the acrobats that were the current floor show attraction. It was the first time she had ever seen a human pyramid being formed, and that so many well-developed masculine bodies should appear all in one clump seemed to her the most wonderful spectacle in the whole world. If Toffee was oblivious of her coming fate, however, Mark was not, Indeed, as he glimpsed Manny's mammoth hand in the impressive process of doubling itself, he found himself regretting his oversight and not reserving a room while at the hospital that morning. He had a strong hunch that he would shortly have need of it. It was then that the unexpected happened. Swiftly, a claw-like hand jutted from beneath the next table and grabbed Manny's thick ankle. In another second, Mark felt the racketeer falling against him, and the two of them were headed for the floor like a couple of felled pines, Instantly for Mark, everything went black. 
In the meantime, Ruby, in her determination to do a really bang-up job on Toffee, was giving her blow all the careful aim and driving power it would need. Squinting, she sighted Toffee's right eye and let go. It was precisely in this moment that Mark's head struck the floor and Toffee vanished into thin air. The man on the flying trapeze had nothing on Ruby. She sailed gracefully through the air and came quickly to a skidding stop on top of a nearby table, at which sat two of the nightclub's more befogged patrons. "'Perfect belly landing!' one of them cried delightedly. "'Smooth as glass!' "'Just like a dame,' complained the other, seeing the incident in a different light. "'Not satisfied with yelping her horrible yellow head off at us up there. She's gonna come over here and knock over our drinks!' Ruby boosted herself dazedly to one elbow and gazed malevolently at the two. Daintily, she picked up a remaining beer bottle and dispatched them to the floor in attitudes of idyllic slumber. "'That'll teach you to talk about a lady,' she mumbled quickly, and with that, silently collapsed. It was in this restful atmosphere that Mark regained consciousness, and for a moment, as he rolled the still unconscious Manny from his chest, he had highly colored thoughts of atomic bombs and such— then, reassuringly, the wild applause of the more awake customers of the nightclub came to his ears. He got to his feet to discover the cause of their noisy enthusiasm. On the dance floor, there was the most remarkable human pyramid anyone had ever seen. It wasn't so much the acrobats themselves. Although they were a fairly curious-looking lot, it was the girl in the black evening dress that sat casually on the shoulders of the topmost man. Toffee had not only materialized, but had chosen her spot for doing so as well and from the spectator's point of view, the effect had been pretty astounding. "'Smartest trick I ever saw,' one seedy little man mumbled to himself. "'But I'm dogged if I can figure out how they got her up there so fast.' Another guest of the Loma, already dazed by drink, gazed wide-eyed at the spectacle, and slipped blissfully under the table. "'I'd have broken me pledge long ago,' he murmured, coming to sodden rest on the floor, "'if I had known I was going to start seeing names like that. It sure beats the snakes. But successful as the glorious tableau was, like all good things, it was destined for an early end. However, it might have continued longer if the base acrobat upon whom the rest were depending for their support hadn't become curious about the audience's sudden approval of the act. Usually at this stage in the performance, a noticeable chill descended on the club. It is hard to say what the fellow expected to see as he turned his head awkwardly to look above him, but judging by subsequent developments, it is a pretty safe guess that it was not a redhead in a dangerous black evening gown, lounging radiantly on the shoulders of his partners, graciously blowing kisses to the audience. To say that the man was shaken is to tell the whole story. There was a dreadful series of whacking sounds as the forces of gravity worked swiftly to bring the entire act to an untimely end. As for Toffee, she alone descended gracefully, looking much like a streamlined ballerina, knocking off the swan after a busy day in the woods. As she bowed in the spotlight, the audience went nearly crazy with loud appreciation. "'I knew they couldn't hold it long,' she said breathlessly, rushing up to Mark. "'They're not as strong as they look.' "'Never mind that,' Mark yelled. "'Let's get out of here before Ruby and Manny wake up. "'If they get a hold of us now, they'll tear us to ribbons.' "'But I thought you wanted to talk to Manny about your briefcase.' "'I don't think he'll be feeling very conversational,' Mark rasped, "'grabbing Toffee's arm and shoving her through the crowd.' Besides, he doesn't know anything about it. That was just a gag. All I'd get out of Manny would be a fractured skull. That's what Ruby was counting on. But what are we going to do now? Uh, there's only one thing to do, Mark said, glancing hastily at his watch. It's nearly eleven now. I'll have to go to the cemetery and try to make a deal. Is a cemetery anything like a nightclub? Toffee asked excitedly. Mark glanced back at the unheeded litter of prostrate figures that graced the Loma Club. Quite a bit like this one, he said wryly. Toffee settled herself comfortably on an ornate tombstone and leaned languorously back to arrest her head on the buttocks of a stone cupid. Get down from there, Mark said sternly. You look obscene. In this moonlight, you're no work of art yourself, Toffee replied lazily, making no effort to move. Mark shrugged helplessly and seated himself watchfully at the base of the stone. It's past eleven, he murmured. I wish someone would show up. If I don't get that copy back, I might as well kiss my business goodbye right now. Maybe Manny's got it after all, Toffee suggested, and he's still out. I don't think so. And speaking of him, I'd sure like to know who the little man under the table was. 
He just about saved my life when he grabbed Manny's ankle. Mark glanced around, peering intently into the darkness that, except for occasional patches of bright moonlight that filtered through the trees, was all around them. It looks like we're all alone here with the spooks. What are spooks? Toffee leaned forward, interested. There's something like you, Mark said absently. Sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. Anyway, I understand they're always raising hell with somebody. <laughs> they sound fine, Toffee said. How do you go about stirring up a few? Never mind, Mark replied. We wouldn't have time for it even if you could. Besides, no self-respecting spook would have anything to do with you. He'd rather be caught dead. Oh, yeah? Toffee said unexpectedly. I'll bet I'm looking at one right now. Nonsense. If you don't believe me, Toffee said woundedly, just look over there. Humoring her, Mark turned his gaze in the direction that she had indicated, and suddenly froze. A claw-like hand was moving stealthily around the edge of a nearby headstone, and the effect was something worse than ghostly. Transfixed, Mark watched it as it came to rest at the foot of the stone, and was suddenly followed by a wizened head. Mark tried hard to suppress a gasp of astonishment as he identified the ferret-like face as the same one that had appeared beneath the table at the club. He had only a moment in which to recognize it, for, as before, it vanished as quickly as it had appeared, to be followed by the clicking sounds that now echoed weirdly through the cemetery. "'Oh, that's not a spook,' Toffee said disappointedly, and then, on second thought, added, "'At least, I don't think it is.' "'You bet it isn't.' Mark cried, jumping quickly to his feet. That's probably the guy that got my briefcase. Swiftly, he took a step forward, caught his toe on a low marker, and sprawled headlong into a landing that was all grin and gravel. His breath was unhesitatingly rushed out to meet the night air, and apparently liked the company, for it didn't bother to come back for a while. In the ensuing stillness, hasty footsteps could be heard making their way out of the cemetery. Well, that's that, I guess, Mark groaned morosely. Then he had regained his breath. I scared him away, and he was my last chance. And to think that he was right next to us in the nightclub all the time. He sat up and rested his chin defeatedly in his cupped hands. With my wife gone and my business gone, I might just as well go away and try to forget it all right now. Maybe you could go where those other men went, Toffee said in a baffling attempt to be helpful. What other men? The ones that work for you. You said they'd gone cavorting, and that sounds pretty forgetful. Did they have something to forget? No, they all got urgent telegrams. Who from? How should I know? For a moment, neither of them spoke, and then, all of a sudden, Mark's chin lifted, and his hands fell to the ground. I'll bet that was a frame-up, too, he said. It was, I'm sure of it. Whoever has my briefcase sent those wires to get the boys out of town so they couldn't get out another campaign. They're all out on a goose chase. Then all we have to do, Toffee said brightly, is find out who sent them. Then we'll know who to see about the briefcase. Yeah, but how? Call up their homes again. It might be an idea, Mark said, his hope rising faintly. Come on down from there. We'll have to find a drugstore with a telephone. With a shockingly familiar hand, Toffee grasped the cupid and boosted herself away from her perch. Let's go, she cried gaily, landing lightly beside Mark. I don't like this place much anyhow. There isn't enough life in it. In the drugstore, Toffee had just finished her third soda, and the teenage fountain attendant, chin on counter, to have a better view of her, had just completed his fiftieth blissful sigh. He had never seen so dazzling a creature anywhere before. Suddenly, they both looked up as the door to the corner telephone boost burst open, and Mark came hurrying out. I've got the name, he said excitedly. It was a Mr. Pulaski, whoever that is. A few of the wives I talked to said their husbands didn't know who it was either, but left because the messages were so urgent. It's my guess that the name's a phony. What are you going to do? I don't know, he said as though just realizing it for the first time. Good night. It's just another dead end, isn't it? For a moment they gazed at each other worriedly as the boy, overcome by his consuming curiosity about Toffee, edged closer. I have it, Toffee cried suddenly. What? yelled Mark and the boy simultaneously. Mark turned witheringly on the youngster and he moved away again. I know what you can do, Toffee continued, pausing long enough to reassure the boy with a radiant smile. You call up the telegraph company and tell them you're Mr. Pulaski. Tell them that you are expecting answers to the wires you sent and you still haven't received any. Then ask them to check to see if the wires were really delivered and check back with you. When they say they will, ask them to check the address and telephone number they have written down for you and insist that they read it to you just to make sure. That way you'll know where Pulaski lives anyway. 
or whoever it is. Mark stared at her in amazement for a moment. I don't know if it'll work, he said. But it's certainly worth a try, Toffee. You're wonderful. He leaned down and kissed her on the forehead. I'm pretty darn surprised myself, Toffee replied happily. I'll say it all over again if you'll kiss me again. But Mark was already on his way to the phone booth. Toffee turned to the boy and shrugged. I don't know what he'd do without me, she said, her voice heavy with theatrical weariness. I simply don't know. Then she smiled as the boy leaned his chin back on the counter and sighed. Mark paid the cab driver and turned to regard the apartment house questioningly. I didn't expect anything quite so shabby, he said. Are you sure this is the number you got from the girl at the telegraph company? Toffee asked. Positive, Mark replied. Well, we can be sure of one thing, at least. Mays wouldn't be living here. I'll bet he's never even seen this part of town. A small frown creased his forehead. Maybe it's just another runaround. Maybe Ruby sent the wires. She could have easily. I'd hate to run into her again. If it is Ruby, Toffee replied heavily, I'll rip that yellow hair of hers out by its black roots. Her and her Irish blood. Well, there's only one way to find out, Mark said wearily, starting forward. Then he stopped as Toffee tugged at his sleeve. What if it turns out to be Manny? she asked apprehensively. Mark winced. We'll just have to face him, I guess. Anyway, it might not be. It could be the little fellow that tripped Manny. Yeah, I guess it could be, Toffee admitted. Well, in that case, let's go. Inside, the old apartment house held all the stale, musty smells of old cooking and all the other activities of daily crowded living, and the gloom in its hallways was almost tangible. Slowly, Mark and Toffee, like a couple of conspirators, crept along the downstairs passage, pausing before each door to read its carelessly stenciled number. Presently, at the rear of the hall, where the gloom was the thickest, they stopped. Well, Mark whispered uneasily, this is number seven. This must be it. Yep, Toffee echoed. This must be it, all right. For a long moment, they just stood and stared at each other with apprehension. Well, Toffee said finally, don't just stand there. Knock. Ring a bell. Do something. Don't rush me, Mark hissed irritably. I'm looking for a nameplate. Well, don't look at me. I'm not wearing one. Try looking on the door. Mark, realizing the wisdom of her advice, turned his attention to the forbidding panel and subjected it to a more thorough scrutiny than was absolutely necessary. All he needed was a magnifying glass to complete his impersonation of Sherlock Holmes on one of his more important cases. He was so close to the door that when it suddenly opened, he nearly pitched into apartment number seven head first. I heard you snooping around out here, a metallic voice shrilled above him. Mark could hardly believe his ears. He had always known that, as long as he lived, he would never see a more horrible-looking woman than Miss Quirt, but now, as he looked up, he was dismayed to find that even she, this time a prickly nightmare in pin curlers, had surpassed herself for sheer frightfulness. And just to complete the picture, there was a strange light in her pallid eyes that he had never seen there before. The movie monsters would have to go a long way to match this, he thought. "'Nice of you to drop in,' Miss Quirt said and her usual twangy voice had something else in it that was almost undefinable. Might as well ask your girlfriend, then, too. From outside, Toffee was spared the alarming sight of Miss Quirt, but the voice had already suggested to her what she might see if the door were fully open. I think I have to be running along, she said uncertainly. Thanks. I think you'd better come in, Mark warned shakily. She's got a gun. Toffee peered around the edge of the door, and her face went starkly white. Her nose had almost brushed against the business end of a pistol that was almost as formidable as Miss Quirt herself. Then, unaccountably, as though remembering a joke, Toffee suddenly smiled and stepped into the room. Well, if you really insist, she said breezily. Toffee's manner had an instant calming effect on Mark, and in the moment in which Miss Quirt closed the door behind Toffee, he felt his sense of reality slowly returning. Is this a joke, Miss Quirt? he demanded. Miss Quirt regarded him with a sidelong hostile glance. I'm not laughing, am I? She shrilled. Then what? You'd sure like to have your hands on that again, wouldn't you? She gloated, gesturing toward a shabby table in the corner. On it, looking like a diamond in the mud, rested Mark's briefcase. He started automatically toward it, but stopped short as, from the corner of his eye, he saw the gun swerve quickly from Toffee to him. 
Don't be greedy, Miss Court said amusedly. I can't get a million dollars together right away, Mark began feverishly, but I'll... Don't be silly, Miss Court broke in with a weird laugh. I wouldn't give it to you for two million, and if you went to the cemetery, I hope you had a lovely time. I'm sorry that I couldn't make it. We saw your friend there, Mark said sourly, but he got away. My friend? Miss Court's eyes rolled and came dangerously close to crossing in a futile attempt to express perplexity. Yes, the little fellow you sent. The one with the ferret face. That clicks, Toffee added helpfully. Miss Quirt looked at them unbelievingly. I didn't send anyone out there, she said, her voice racing uphill out of control. I had no intention of going myself either. That was just a touch of mystery to throw you off the track. I don't intend to give you that briefcase at any price. Besides, she added thoughtfully, I don't know any little ferrets that... that click. I wonder who it was. Toffee said, deeply absorbed in the question. The strange fanatic gleam suddenly burned more brightly in the horrible woman's eyes. I'm going to ruin you, Mark Pillsworth, she announced dramatically, her stringy voice rising to such a pitch that it caused one to wonder if she hadn't studied bird calls at one time or another. Then she added as an afterthought, And I think I'll kill you, too. But why? Mark and Toffee chorused. Miss Quirt's eyes rolled again, this time in a painful attempt at coyness. You promise you won't tell? She asked foolishly. Mark and Toffee exchanged a glance that held a full hour's discussion on the woman's mental status. Of course not, Toffee said persuasively. Your secret couldn't be in safer hands. Well, Miss Quirt said, becoming incongruously chatty, considering the formidable weapon in her hand. I'll tell you all about it. It's all part of a plan, and it's terribly clever. I'm sure you'll think so. She paused to smile at them like a five-year-old about to recite a poem before company. I've been working for big firms for twenty years now. And just working, that's all. I've been watching my smug employers and their smug wives going about their smug lives, never giving me a thought, for twenty years. Can you imagine what that can do to a sensitive woman like me? She turned pleading eyes on Toffee. Had a boss ever made a pass at me? No, Toffee cried, catching the confessional spirit of the thing. Miss Quirt nodded approvingly. She seemed to like the dramatic effect. Has a boss's wife ever been jealous of me? She screeched. No, Toffee cried again, recognizing her cue. That's right, Miss Quirt continued sadly, brushing a tear away from the end of her nose with the muzzle of the gun, then promptly leveling the weapon directly to Mark's heart. They never have. So I decided to ruin the lot of them. She turned back to Mark. You're not the first one, she said, beginning to brighten. There have been many others. I used to work for Mr. Burke. The Mr. Burke that committed suicide? Mark faltered. That's right, Miss Quirt answered proudly. That was one of my most poetic projects. Mr. Burke found himself with a lot of worthless stock on his hands one morning and simply jumped out the window. He died without ever knowing who had bought the stuff for him. We parted the best of friends. He left me one of my very finest references along with the suicide note. It did end well, didn't it? Toffee put in blandly. Yes, it was just lovely, Miss Quirt agreed. Much better than the job I did on old Mr. Grant. He didn't leave me any reference at all, and I had to write it myself. How I hate forgery! Of course, it may not have been entirely his fault. After all, they did rush him something awful when they came to take him away to the asylum. A dreamy, reminiscent look came into her eyes. The job with Mr. Forbes was much better. He said some very nice things about me before he left for prison. I was the last one he said goodbye to. Mark shuddered. A very impressive career, he said. But you can't get away with it this time. I know that it was you that stole my briefcase. Yes, Miss Quirt answered promptly. And that is why I'm going to have to make corpses of you. So you can't talk, you know. It's really not my way of doing things, but I suppose that everyone has to make exceptions occasionally. She turned to Toffee and smiled. I'm sorry to have to put you out of the way, dear, but you understand, I'm sure. Oh, perfectly, Toffee said, helpfully returning the smile. Mark was beginning to wonder just how many of them were crazy, and in what combination. Even Toffee was making less sense than usual. And if I do say so myself, Toffee continued, Mark and I will make lovely corpses. Oh, indeed you will, Miss Quirt agreed enthusiastically. 
Some of the nicest I've ever seen, and you'll be the very first ones that I've made all by myself. I'll be very proud of you. Well, that's nice to know, Toffee said. But you're not going to use that gun, are you? Why not? It won't work, Toffee said simply. You'd better think of something else. Miss Quirt looked at her suspiciously. What do you mean it won't work? We hate to admit it, and we wouldn't to anyone else, Toffee said. But Mark and I are a little odd in some ways. Guns don't phase us. In fact, there's very little that does. If you doubt me, shoot me and see for yourself. Mark's mouth started open in alarm, but closed again as Toffee winked at him. Apparently, Miss Quirt was open to suggestions, as was Miss Ruby Marlowe. All right, she said agreeably, a shrewd look coming into her eyes. Just stand over there. Toffee followed her directions and took her place before the wall, and near Mark, where Miss Quirt could keep them both covered during the experiment. Be sure you fire close up, she said. I wouldn't want you to miss. Don't worry, Miss Quirt said menacingly, leveling the gun at Toffee. I won't. She squeezed down the barrel, her eyes really crossing this time, and pressed the trigger. There was a sudden flash of white light and an explosion. A crack etched its way crazily through the plaster just behind Toffee, but Toffee herself remained just as she had been, a composed, smiling figure in a scandalous black evening dress. You see, she said, you'll just have to think of something else. Miss Quirt stared at her, not seeming to be so much amazed as thoughtful. I'll have to think this over, she said pensively. I had my heart set on making corpses of you, being my first and all, you know. She crossed to the door and locked it, keeping the key, then turning back to them apologetically. "'I'm afraid I'll have to leave you for a while,' she said. "'I'll have to dream about this. I get all my best ideas in my dreams.' "'I'll bet you do,' Mark said flatly. She regarded the crack in the wall for a moment. "'The landlord's going to make an awful fuss about that. He's so narrow-minded. What's a home if you can't shoot it up a bit once in a while?' She turned to Toffee. "'It's rude of me, I know, to leave you alone like this, but I... Simply have to get to sleep right away, to think of some way to rub you out, as they say. You won't mind. <laughs> Certainly not, Toffee replied grandly. Go right ahead. As the strange woman started in the direction of the bedroom, Mark turned amazedly to Toffee. She's crazy as a loon, he whispered. Balmy as a night in June, Toffee hissed back. Suddenly Miss Quirt whirled about. I heard that, she shrieked. I heard what you said. She regarded Toffee regretfully. And I thought you were such a nice, helpful girl, too. It makes me sad to know that you can't be trusted. Now I won't be able to enjoy having your corpse around like I would have. She moved quickly to a closet, dragged out two straitjackets, and handed them to Mark and Toffee. Put them on, she commanded, brandishing her gun. They're perfectly lovely, Toffee said sarcastically, struggling into hers. They remind me of nurses' uniforms. Where did you ever get them? Oh, I have dozens of them. Miss Quirt said proudly, and they were all given to me every time I go for a vacation. When I leave, they give me one of those. I remember a lovely summer Bellevue. The one you have on reminds me of it. A few minutes later, Miss Quirt surveyed her trussed-up guests from her bedroom door and smiled with satisfaction. I think the gags were a nice idea, too, she said. You'll have to be quiet anyway, if I am to get any sleep. Then, closing the door, she sighed. Oh, but you'll make such lovely corpses, and I can hardly wait to have some of my own. Silently, Mark and Toffee, their mouths uncomfortably full of Miss Quirt's more intimate garments, gazed at each other mournfully. It would be supposed that the last minutes of one life would seem to pass with a terrible swiftness, but to Mark it seemed that the minutes of the last two hours had dragged like the third act of a bad play, and he was certainly convinced that the morning would see him a corpse and the fact that his lifeless body would receive all the personal care and attention due it as the victim of Miss Quirt's first murder didn't help his state of mind as one might have supposed. He was not surprised that Toffee, during the last five minutes or so, had begun to behave peculiarly. She seemed to be acting on a definite pattern, for she had repeated her little routine three times now, and it had always been precisely the same. She would leave her chair, walk directly to the wall, stand facing it for a moment, and then bend over at the hips as though looking at something on the floor. This done, she would look up at Mark and nod her head toward the spot which she had been watching. At first, Mark merely thought it was nice that Miss Quirt had left their legs free, if exercise meant so much to Toffee. But then, slowly, he began to realize that perhaps the nodding meant that Toffee had discovered something and wished him to follow her. 
Walking to the wall, he waited until Toffee began to bend forward and followed her example. Once down, he gazed at the floor intently, but there didn't seem to be anything to see except a dismal section of very ordinary flooring. He looked up questioningly, but Toffee motioned him back again. This time he gave the floor his undivided attention. He was determined to discover what it was she had been looking at, and wanted him to see. At least it would give him something to think about besides becoming a dead body. If Mark had seen Toffee remove herself from his side to a position just behind him, he would probably have moved away from the wall like a flash, but since he did not, he remained just as he was, bent over, head to the wall, and perfectly motionless. Toffee couldn't have asked for a more willing victim or a more perfect target. Slowly, as she brought her foot to Mark's unsuspecting posterior, a pained expression crept into her green eyes. She hesitated a moment, made a few practice kicks for aim, then swung her foot quickly behind her. Sure of her aim now, she closed her eyes tightly and brought her foot forward with all the force of a sledgehammer. There was a dreadful splitting sound as Mark's head struck the wall. As he dropped to the floor and rolled over, the blissful, foolish grin of unconsciousness was discernible even behind the gag. In the next second, the room had become deathly still. As Mark closed the door to Gregory Reese's office, he saw Toffee waiting for him near the elevator and scowled. Somehow in the morning light, the black dress seemed to leave even more of her exposed than it had in the evening. Undaunted, Toffee smiled brightly at the sight of him. Did he like the advertising campaign? she asked. Are you going to get the account? Mark nodded warily. Yes, he said in a dead voice. He was very enthusiastic. What did he say? I don't know, Mark replied sourly. I could barely hear him. My head was roaring like a lion cage at feeding time. He turned to her fretfully. Was it absolutely necessary for you to drive my head halfway through that wall? If that landlord's to be sore about that bullet hole, he'll fairly scream his head off at the chunk of plaster I knocked out. I had to be sure, Toffee explained logically. I had to be sure you'd lose consciousness so I could return to your subconscious until you woke up. It was the only way I could get out of that straitjacket. You know that. Well, you could have told me so I could have braced myself. Mark argued unreasonably. You nearly broke my neck. With a gag in my mouth? No, I guess not, Mark admitted reluctantly. But it seems that you could have tempered your blow a little, at least. He frowned as Toffee suddenly began to giggle. What's so funny? I was thinking of the desk sergeant down at headquarters. When I materialized, I miscalculated a bit and faded right in on top of his desk. He nearly had me locked up without even listening to what I had to say. I don't know when he looked more mixed up, then or later, when he got a load of Miss Quirt and those curlers. Now that I've got the account, Mark sighed, I wonder if it was all worth it. Of course it was, Toffee said. I thought it was loads of fun. If Mark's eyes had really held the power that their expression suggested, the ceiling would certainly have been down around Toffee's flaming head without further delay. Let's get a cup of coffee, he suggested helplessly. My head's chiming like Big Ben at midnight. All right, Toffee agreed, reaching for the elevator button. No, not that, Mark yelled. The way that young fiend in there operates that thing, I'd be lucky to get downstairs with the top of my head still on. Let's take the stairs. As together they started down the carpeted stairway, Mark became pensive. Even if the matter of the briefcase had been settled, his trouble with Julie was still as bad as it had been the day before. Probably worse, for all he knew. Then, too, there was the problem of Toffee. Matters certainly wouldn't improve with her around. His troubled conjecture came to an abrupt end at the sound of Toffee's anxious voice. Look out, she cried. Look out for that tear in the carpet. Why did you... Whatever Mark was going to say was lost for good as the toe of his shoe slipped under the torn carpet, for in the next instant he was flying head first down the length of the stairs, steps flashing past his face like boxcars on a fast freight. Down and down he fell, on and on. And then, looking away from the stairs for a brief moment, he could see that he was heading into a dense black fog that obscured the bottom of the stairway. As he drew close to this fog, it seemed to reach toward him and swallow him up, and then he found that he was falling through a great, unknown region that was devoid of all light. He wondered where the floor had gone. When finally he came to rest, Mark couldn't calculate how long he had been falling. It seemed an endless period. Wonderingly, he sat up and looked around him for some bit of light, some reassuring bit of brightness that would tell him he hadn't lost his sight. Even as he searched, however, the fog began to lift, becoming lighter and lighter, 
until there was nothing left of it except a soft blue mist. Immediately, his surroundings were familiar this time. The valley was just as comforting and lovely as he had remembered it. "'It hardly seems fair,' came Toffee's petulant voice, and turning, Mark discovered her standing just behind him. "'What hardly seems fair?' he asked, rising to his feet. "'That I only got to materialize for a single night this time. The way you bounce me in and out of your subconscious is a screaming crime. I suppose I'll have to sit around here for another eternity, just waiting for you to get into another scrape that you can't get yourself out of.' "'That's right,' Mark said, grinning at her affectionately. "'Every time I find myself in a tight spot, I just say to myself, "'Well, Mark, old boy, it's time to drop in and pick up Toffee. "'Now there's a girl that can really fix things up.' "'He stopped speaking and smiled down at her wryly. "'I bet you do,' she pouted. "'You just use me. Men are all selfish dogs.' "'And don't you love them,' said Mark. "'Suddenly Toffee grinned. "'I guess I do,' she laughed. I suppose I'm just sore because it always comes to an end so soon. It'll all be over in a minute now. Kiss me goodbye. Naturally, said Mark, and took her tenderly into his arms. After a long moment, he released her and looked down to find that she was smiling up at him. And remember, she said, think of something off-color once in a while so I'll have something to work on. Besides, it'll be good for you. <laughs> I will, Mark laughed. I'll think of you. That is... I'll think of you when Julie... Suddenly his smile faded into an expression of deep concern. Julie, she's still going to divorce me. You're walking out on me this time before everything's settled. No, I'm not, Toffee said. Everything will be all right. I believe you want me to be divorced. Nonsense, Toffee replied seriously. You two love each other, and I wouldn't have anything happen to that for the world. Julie just needed something to... Jar her out of her jealousy, and I think she's had it. When you get... Toffee's voice trailed off into the distance, and Mark looked down to find that his arms were empty. She had vanished into the mist, it seemed. Toffee! Toffee! He called, but there was no answer, and all of a sudden he felt dreadfully alone. His sense of loss was deep and painful. Then the voice broke through the stillness. Rah! Rah! It boomed, just as before. And also, as before, it seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere. Run! Run! It repeated more urgently this time. Without questioning the reason, Mark began to run frantically, dodging this way and that to avoid. He didn't know what. Then, with horror, he realized that in his confusion he had run in the wrong direction, for the black fog was directly in front of him, reaching toward him. Mark turned, but it was too late. Already it was shutting out the soft light of the valley. Run! Run! The voice continued weirdly. In the runner! There was a terror lady, a strange voice was saying, and he must have caught his toe in it. Anyway, we found him at the foot of the stairs. That's all I know about it. Well, thank you very much for bringing him, Julie's voice answered. I'm sure he'll be very grateful to you when he wakes up. There followed the sound of retreating footsteps and a door closing. Mark kept his eyes closed and listened until he heard Julie returning. Slowly, he opened his eyes and was glad to find that he was propped up in a chair in his own living room. Well, Julie exclaimed annoyedly, seeing that his eyes were open. So you decided to wake up after all, did you? The men that just dragged you in here said that you'd fallen down a flight of stairs. What a laugh that is. Dead drunk and out cold would be more like it. But I did fall down, Mark protested feebly. It's a wonder they didn't come hauling that vile little redhead in with you, Julie said icily. Where did she collapse? But you don't understand about her, Mark said desperately. Ha! snorted Julie, and the laugh that followed the inelegant exclamation was frozen solid around the edges. But Julie, Mark pleaded wretchedly, I... There's a gentleman waiting to see you, ma'am, Mary the maid interrupted. His name is Mr. Dimbert. Send him in here, Julie said, a grim smile forming on her lips. If it's someone to see you, Mark said apologetically, starting to rise, I'll just go to my room. Oh, no, Julie cried. This ought to be of great interest to you. I really wouldn't want you to miss it. Very well, he said apprehensively, sinking back into the chair. In a moment, Marie appeared again in the doorway. Mr. Dimbert, ma'am, she announced and swiftly disappeared. Mark's eyes moved listlessly to the doorway, and then suddenly froze on the man that stood there. 
It was the ferret-faced little fellow from the Loma Club in the cemetery. Mark flinched at the memory of the clicking sounds and the man's mysterious behavior. Then he was aware that Julie was watching him. I want you to know Mr. Dimbert, Mark, she said smoothly. He's from the Regal Detective Agency, and he had the pleasure of following you all last evening, if you can call it a pleasure. From what he told me over the telephone this morning, it must have been some night. He tells me that he even had to save you from a thug once, for the divorce courts, of course. A private detective? Mark asked bewilderingly. I knew you'd be interested, Julie said with amusement, and then turned to the odd little man who had remained in the doorway. Come in, come in, she called graciously. I hope you brought the pictures. Yes, I did, the fellow squeaked. I picked them up only a moment ago and rushed them right over, without ever taking time to look at them myself. He moved with a mouse-like quickness across the room and deposited an envelope in Julie's eager hand. They're all there. The nightclub, the cemetery, the drugstore, and the apartment house. You can see the address plainly on that last one, I think. I was right in front when I took it. Thank you, Julie said, turning to smile viciously at Mark. Mr. Dembert photographed you and that red-headed trollop deer everywhere you went last night. The results ought to be mighty interesting to the judge. Mark winced as he saw Julie open the envelope and draw out the pictures. He closed his eyes tight. He couldn't bear to see what was going to happen when Julie saw them. There would never on earth be a way to explain them. It seemed that the room remained quiet for an eternity until Julie's voice unexpectedly cut through the stillness like a knife. "'Get out!' she screamed. "'Get out of this house, and don't you ever try to set foot in it again. If you do, I'll have you thrown out. You, you, dirty, lying, double-dealing cheat!' Mark sincerely wished that he had done so earlier, rose slowly to his feet and moved in the direction of the door without even bothering to open his eyes. Then, thinking that Julie must be behind him by now, he opened them and suddenly stopped short. Mr. Dimbert, more mouse-like than ever, was scurrying toward the door in a fit of terror. Quickly, he skidded around the corner and was out of sight. A split second later, the slam of the front door announced his final departure. But what? Mark stammered, turning to Julie. As if he hadn't had enough surprises, he was suddenly presented with one more that was even more confounding than any of the others. Julie's expression as she came toward him was one of absolute contriteness. "'Oh, Mark,' she cried, "'can you ever forgive me? I might have known you weren't out with that woman. The minute I got outside your office last night, I knew I'd made a fool of myself. But I had to be sure. That's why I hired the detective. And when I thought you'd gone out with that redhead—' A flame of anger flickered briefly in her eyes. "'And to think I let that little rat take me in with his phony reports!' Again she turned pleadingly to Mark. "'Please say you'll forgive me.' Mark stared at her aghast for a moment, wondering if he had finally lost his mind. Then his gaze darted to the scattered pile of photographs. Quickly he crossed over and picked them up, looked at them, and then dropped them disdainfully to the floor. "'I'll think it over,' he said severely, turning to Julie. "'I don't know if I'll forgive you or not. You behaved very badly, I think. I'm going to my room to think about it, and I'll let you know my decision in exactly half an hour.' With that, he turned and strode majestically out of the room. Reaching the hallway out of Julie's sight, he suddenly stopped, and the grin that broke across his face teetered dangerously on the edge of hearty laughter. "'I might have known all along that Toffee wouldn't photograph,' he murmured. Then he shook his head wonderingly and continued to his room. It would be nice, he thought, just having lunch in his own home with his own wife. End of You Can't Scare Me, Part 2 End of The Early Misadventures of Toffee by Charles F. Myers